Uh, welcome to the second day of the final quarterly meeting of the Board of Psychology. Uh, we are going to be going into closed session. I would expect the very earliest we're going to be done at 1030. Uh, so for those of you that are not supposed to be in closed session, we'd ask that you leave the room. And uh, as soon as we are ready to go back into open session, someone will come out and let you guys know. But you don't need to hang around probably for the next hour. Before we do that, however, why don't we take roll? Kasuga. Here. Cervantes. Here. Fu. Aye. Harbsheets. Here. Horn. Here. Phillips. Here. Tate. Here. Quorum established. Thank you. We are now going into. Uh, good morning for those of you that are just joining us. This is the uh, fourth quarterly meeting of the California Board of Psychology. Um, I just want to lay out a few things for you all um, in advance of us starting. Uh, number one, if you have a cell phone or other device that rings, could you please set it to silent or turn it off? Um, number two, um, to the extent that anybody would like to come up for public comment, which we welcome, we just ask that they not mention a specific licensee's name during the course of public comment, only because as the body that ultimately sits on disciplinary matters or enforcement matters, uh, that person may come before us and your comments, if we know the name of the person you're talking about might prejudice in our deliberations. Uh, the third thing I will mention is that um, Board members are using computers in front of them. You can see that's because we've gone to a paper light format. And in that paper light format, um, in that paper light format, uh, we attempt as much as possible to do to use digital processes to avoid too much paper. So we're not here playing Candy Crush or whatever people play on their computers. I'm not sure. I play solitaire. Um, and the final item is if there is a public comment item and there's several people that want to speak to that public comment item, I will be uh, putting a, placing a limitation on time, no matter who you represent or what organization you're from. So um, that's just so we can get through the agenda. As it stands right now, we've, we're going to have to cut substantial portions of the agenda. We don't, we've got several action items that we need to get to today. So with all that being said, welcome. <laughs> it's not the most welcoming message, is it? Um, and uh, the first item on the agenda that we're going to go to is item number 20. We've already established a quorum earlier in the day, by the way. Uh, this is public comment for items not on the agenda. Uh, a note, the board may not discuss or take action on any matters raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to include that item on future agendas. Is there any public comment on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move to item number 21, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Update. Mr. Fu. In keeping with accordance to um, the timepiece, we're just going to be focusing on a couple of these items here. So the first item is um, item 21A1, Senate Bill 275. And so this bill is the board-sponsored bill related to adding sexual behaviors um, to um, statute. It was um, it became a two-year bill um, with some requests from the committee for technical amendments. The technical the technical amendments are in, a, in the attachment, and they are highlighted in yellow. Um, and specifically, they reference a different part of the the code and the uh, elimination of a comma. Um, so there's a request to um, approve the proposed amendments to Senate Bill 275 and direct staff to continue working with Senator Pan to achieve passage of the bill in the 2020 legislative session. Um, Ms. Burns, anything else to add on this item? No. Uh, it's very technical amendments. Originally, the bill, um, when it was first put into the code, it had 728 or 729, apologies. Um, in the 90s, it changed to 728 for some reason. We still look at none of the analysis, talk about why. It's just referencing what, um, where they define sexual contact. So 
729 is just fine. And the removal of the contact comma makes uh, sexual behavior as defined in subdivision B just even clearer. There's no separation between those two items. Yep. So is there a motion to adopt the um, proposed amendments and direct staff? Second. Second. So it's been moved by Dr. Tate, seconded by Dr. Kusuga. Is there public comment on this item? Seeing and hearing none, any board discussion? Ms. Burns, please call the roll. Bernal? Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. The motion passes. I believe this is our only item in the legislative section for action. So we are going to then, well, looks like then the next item in sequence. Okay. Um, I just wanted to note that the uh, technical cleanup bill, SB 786, was signed by the governor oh, um, recently. So just a quick update that the bill was signed. Excellent. Do um, you want to comment on SB 53? I thought we're doing action board. items only. I think that's right, but SB 53 was of major concern to the board, yes. so mm -hmm. I think it should be addressed. Okay, great. Uh, SB 53 Wilk, which was about making two member committees a publicly noticed committee meeting um, that would have also impacted our legislative visits, our ability to have enforcement staff at the enforcement committee meetings um, due to the public safety concerns. Um, that bill has died in committee and it did not get to the governor's desk, so that is shelved for the time being. Of course, any bill can be brought up in the next year, but we'll keep you apprised if something changes in the meantime. I think then we're going to move to item 23. Um, this is under regulatory updates, and it's specific to the, here, let me pull up the section. And this is page 189 in your combined PDF. And so this is with regard to the retired license, renewal or expired license, psychological fee, psycho, psychologist fee, excuse me, um, with the attachment A with the language here. This is with regard to um, newly proposed language um, in section 1381.10 for retired status. Um, Ms. Burns? Yes, so uh, in the statutory provisions regarding the retired status, it talks about uh, that the retired status would not be extended to those that are otherwise restricted by the board or those subject to discipline under this chapter. So staff noticed that we should address this inside of the language and in the ISOR or initial statement of reasons um, so that the public and applicants are very much aware of who can and cannot get into the retired status. So if you are currently on probation, you cannot simply retire. If you are restricted from practice for a variety of legal or board reasons, then you would also not be able to enter the retired status. Um, similar to subject to discipline, if an accusation has been filed against you, you don't get to enter into retired status. So it's not a workaround for discipline. It is definitely the um, standing, in, in good standing, retirement status, um, and that just clarifies it in the reg. It'll be clear to those applying for it, um, so it's very transparent this way. So that is the highlighted A2 and A3 of that section, and we would just ask for approval of the uh, revised regulatory language so that we can continue on with the process. Thank you, Ms. Burns. Is there a motion to adopt the uh, revised regulatory language for item 23D as in David, and that's page 192 on your PDFs? I so move. Just a moment. I'll oh. second. Just to quickly find it, it would be a motion to approve the language for notice. Yes. Yeah, we're not adopting Yes, apologies. So the motion would be to um, approve the language for noticing. And I think I heard a motion from Dr. Harbsheets and a second from Dr. Tate. Is that correct? Um, is there public comment on this item? Seeing, hearing none. Any additional board discussion? Ms. Burns, could you please call the roll? Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes? Mm. Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. 
think turn it back to you, Mr. President. Wow. Okay, so we're going to next go to item number 24, which is review and consideration of... We just need to do 28D first. Oh, 28D first? And then okay. 24. Right. Um, so we need to leap ahead to item number 28D, which is part of the licensure committee report. Uh, so if we could just deal with that right now, that'll make be helpful in terms of our consideration of the sunset report. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me find it in my thing. There it is. Page what? 601, I believe. 601, next page. Okay. All right, so page uh, 601 of the combined uh, materials. Um, and uh, if you all can read this here, uh, right now the uh, licensure committee uh, deliberates on certain requests um, in closed session to protect the privacy of um, our licensees when they're requesting certain, uh, well, requesting certain things for us, from us. And, uh, but we have to bring it to the full board for action, meaning that uh, the confidentiality uh, is compromised or potentially compromised of these licensees. And um, what we would like is, uh, and, and the reason for that is the statutes uh, indicate that if um, that a, a committee like the licensure committee um, can only be an advisory committee to the full board, otherwise it's in violation of the Open Meetings Act. So we have to bring everything to the Open uh, Meetings Act, uh, to the full board for consideration. And this would allow the licensure committee to um, essentially be the final decision uh, and so that this doesn't have to be brought to the full board for in, in front of the public and everything when we're talking about these uh, confidential matters about licensees. And uh, there is precedent for this. Uh, the dental board does this and um, it it is in statute. So we would, uh, we're requesting from the board that um, you allow the licensure committee to have this same ability to make these uh, decisions um, that keep the information private. In the time I've been here, I don't think there's been any time the licensure committee ha has suggested something to the full board that you haven't actually agreed. One time. One, was there one time? Yeah. Okay. The, it was the course in human sexuality that's right, for the out-of-state right, yeah. psychologist. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one time um, in the six years that I've been here. So it it's very unusual, obviously, that this would happen, but uh, it also, we feel like it would really maintain the privacy of our licensees about these kinds of matters. So. I, I wanted to mention one, one other thing that would be, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Red button. No, it's all lit up. Your mic doesn't show red. That's why. Oh. oh. I hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll show you. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons for doing this also is that because you have to go through a licensing committee meeting and then wait till the next board right. meeting, sometimes there are inordinate delays mm -hmm. in actually making some kind of decision on the petition, um, which is that have time. 
consideration. Right. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll grant another year on a psychic citizenship, but by the time they've gotten to it, their time would have lapsed under the original registration. So they're kind of caught betwixt and between. So I think this would also allow us to be a little That's bit more right. yeah. time effective in responding mm -hmm. to things. Thank you. I would move that we adopt the proposed statutory amendments and seek legislation with regard to allowing the licensure committee to meet in closed session to make final licensure determinations. I second. My peeps. <laughs> so it's been moved and seconded that uh, the board allowed this and to create statutory changes that would go I guess go into our sunset um, review process. So is there any more board discussion or any board discussion about this? Any public uh, discussion about this? Okay. I just wanted to point out to the board that the language that has been drafted for your review still uh, requires the board to delegate to the licensing committee that authority. So okay. the board would still have that control to delegate. All right. All right, so seeing no discussion. Uh, Thank you. Oh, sorry, seeing no discussion. Um, would you call the roll, please? Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. So we are now moving back to agenda item number 24, uh, which is a review and consideration of the Sunset Review Committee report. Um, we are relatively early on in this process. Well, not that early on, but it's, we're, not toward, we're not coming into the final lap. Um, this is the initial draft that has been reviewed by the Sunset Committee. Mm -hmm. Wanted to bring it to the board for your comments. We will be having another board meeting by telephone in November or December? November 8th. November 8th, um, at which time you'll have an opportunity to see revisions that have been made based on your comments here today. Mm -hmm. um, how do you want to handle this? Um, so uh, it might be easiest if we go section by section and if any uh, board member has uh, a comment, question, or an edit um, for each uh, section, just uh, let Dr. Phillips know and we can address it from there. Um, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, this is uh, part of a process of sunset review that the board undertakes uh, every few years with the state legislature. It's done with the Assembly and Senate Business and Professions Committees. Uh, we t submit the report to the committees um, in December, and then uh, we have a hearing in the spring, usually in March. Um, and that's their opportunity to ask any further clarification questions. Um, and then it becomes a bill which may have some statutory changes that we have identified if the committees accept those changes. And then it would ultimately, hopefully, extend the board for another few years. So I just wanted to put it in context. Um, and we can go from there. Okay. So we're going to start uh, our review by looking at uh, section one, uh, background and description of the board and regulated professions. Does any board member have any comment with respect to this particular section? Yeah, I see that. Is page 221 still part of section one? I don't believe so. One? No, it's not. I see it here. Okay. Would any, any board member like to make a comment on section one? I don't see anybody making comments. Um, What's, it sounds like Mary, do you? That's section three. Oh, okay. 
Is there any public comment on section one? I guess we should take it as we go. Sure. Yeah. You know, I have a, a quick question. What is the time frame that's covered? Microphone. 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 Can you push oh. your Sorry. What's the time frame that's covered in the the reporting in the sunset review? So I think it depends on the section. Um, some of oh, the okay, sections so are uh, fiscal year, a couple of them might be calendar year, um, but what we're covering is from the last sunset review mm -hmm. to the current sunset review is is a general typical time period. And then there are sections that we noticed they would ask since the last sunset and others where they only ask for data for three years. Mm -hmm. So there okay. is a year in between right after the being approved last time that mm -hmm. there's just they didn't ask for the data for for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So. I, so, for example, I noticed that I'm not listed in some of these sections as a board member. So that's why I asked. Under? In the first section? In the first section? No, just like in general. So um, I'm asking just a general mm -hmm. question about date and time frame because that will inform how I give feedback. Gotcha. But now you just clarified that it, they're different. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, it sounds like yeah. it's section dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. when one of those comes up, let us okay. know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, having let's move on to section number two of the sunset report. It's a lot of scrolling. Sorry. It's no, that's, don't worry about it. By the way, um, some portions of this report as we're all getting to wherever what page mm -hmm. do we need to get to? Two oh six. Two oh six? Oh two oh five, sorry. Okay. Line six seventy one. If Line you're in the paper done. copy. Mm -hmm. My son. Line six seventy one. That's where section two starts. Section two, that's question two. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> I have the report on the projector for the public, so I, I've only got line numbers right now to okay. give you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Section two. Oh, okay, got it. Section. So page two seventeen of the combined report. Line six seventy one. Okie Are there any board comments on section number two? Performance measures and customer satisfaction surveys. Mm -hmm. Any public comments on section number two? Seeing none, let's keep rolling. Um, section number three starts on 219 of the combined PDF package, uh, fiscal and staff. Which begins on line 737 for the public. I have a comment. Okay. Um, on page 221, number 14, on the combined, Mary, I'm sorry, can you just speak oh, sorry, on page 221, at the top it says uh, 14, describe license renewal cycles, line 800, um, it says um, effective January 1, 2016, the renewal cycle for licensed psychologist change to two years from the date of issuance and um, is that that was just for people becoming newly licensed at that time and I thought maybe it would help to clarify that that was not for all licensees but just those becoming newly licensed that date or after I think staff didn't think to clarify that since licensees licensed prior to that at this point are now all on the two-year cycle as well. It just was their first, first prorated year, which wouldn't have been a two-year cycle. Oh, so it was prorated. It wasn't that they continue on that. Exactly. So one, mm -hmm. the way it used to work is you would be licensed, but that might be on your that was that one day and then it would go to your birthday right so they might have a three-month license and then start the two-year renewal cycle after that or they could have a 10-month license and then it would start that way mm -hmm. so um, this at this point everyone now at this point is on a two-year cycle regardless of when you were licensed at this point so I and think still on the last day of the month of their birthday month yes 
Well, no, uh, the newly, since 2016, it's based on when you're registered. When you're initially when, you, when you're approved, licensed. I'm sorry. Yeah. Exactly. So if you were issued the license on 1021 of 19, it's going to be the end of that month in two years. So. Right. Right. It's a little confusing to but me. people who are yeah, I agree. People who are already licensed, let's say you were licensed in 1982, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Pick that number yeah. out of the hat. Then um, what happens? Uh, you've been doing it the your, birthday, last day. So it's on your birth month, but you're on a two-year renewal right. cycle based on that birth month. So. So it's still a two-year renewal cycle. That well, that's yeah. that's what Mary's saying. It's not clear mm. here. Right. Gotcha. You might want right. to put that there. About the prior to the state licensees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Would we like that as a separate sentence or? Dr. Harpsheets, yeah. is there any recommended language that would clarify that for you that you you might suggest? that we can include? We, ha we have it in draft form so we can make the changes on the spot. Yes. Um, I might add a sentence. You know, can I just give that to you later? Because I would, or do you want it now? You want it now? Okay. <laughs> I saw that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, renewal cycle, change to date. Oh, and so, um, would for licensees, for people license or for licensees licensed January 1, 2016, and thereafter, the renewal cycle changed change to two years from the date of issuance. Uh, previous licensees continue uh, to have licenses expire at 12 midnight on the last day of the month of the birth date. Does that make sense? Birth month. I, yeah, birthday during second birth year of two terms. Were you birthday. wanting that as a separate sentence? Oh, yes. I, well, I. There um, are two sentences. Yeah. There yeah. are two sentences, but there are two sentences here also. I'm going to need you to go back. <laughs> so I, I'm curious okay. if you want that to be included. I'm changing those. I'm changing those sentences. Okay. Both sentences. Mm -hmm. I'm changing okay. both sentences. So, are you not wanting it in the the sentence to start there? Of no changes, been no changes to the renewal cycle in the past ten years. However, do you want that to be a separate sentence there? No. However, is fine. Okay. How, however, uh, licensees who licensees who were licensed January 1, 2016 or after uh, the renewal cycle changed to two years from the date of issuance. Previously licensees, this is that next sentence, um, so I would say, what did I say? Previous, uh, those licensed previously, licenses continue to expire at 12 midnight on the last day of the month. Of their birth, yeah, it goes. It got more detailed. Last year, the month of the birth date of the licensee yeah. during the second year. Um, instead of saying, oh, let me go back to my mic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was going to be a hard place for them to see. Instead of saying licensees who, whose licenses were issued, that seems clunky to me. Mm -hmm. Why don't we say for license issued on or after? Licenses. Yes, that's better. That's better, thanks. Oh, yeah. I know, you can't see anything. I actually think we need to move that so we can see it because yeah. two th thirds of the board can't see it. <laughs> it's okay. He'll we'll move it. it says. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I think we'll just rotate it this way and they'll just not see it. 
I mean, I don't know how we get around this conundrum, but okay. if we're the actual drafters, I think we should actually see the language we're drafting. Otherwise, yeah. we have no idea what's up there. It's actually hard to see here. <laughs> really? We could stand up. That's but then we'll be far from the microphones. <laughs> yeah. No, that is better. Can we do full page on the word under view? Yeah. Oh. See, I know something about technology. <laughs> if you go to I'll suggest next time yeah. we can that go to a oh, go to a webinar and oh, you've got I just increased it already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No worries, I just zoomed for you. <laughs> I got you covered. Yeah, there's a Screen. button you can hit that just goes to page with. Uh, oh. uh, I'll show you later. Now that's technology. Oh, I see that button. Yeah. Yeah. It's really easy. I use it all the time. It's too big for me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. It shouldn't say that. It shouldn't say those licenses previously. Licenses continue to for those previously licensed or. Yeah, I think. Yeah. How about licensed prior? Oh, oh yeah, prior to that date. Yeah. Okay. So it's consistent. Much clearer. The I think. license continues. Continues to expire. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, when are these supposed to be December thirty first, twenty fifteen? Ah, I gotcha. Yeah. Good catch. Can I turn off the phone? You're all. We're missing somebody here. There you go. Well, wait. A they could, they, could they could be, be the same. On December 31st. So yeah, prior. Yeah. Prior on or prior to. Yeah. 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 Or we can keep it prior and keep the same date. <laughs> better? Okay. Yeah, better. It looks like we've resolved that particular conundrum. Are there any other comments on section number three? Any public comment on section number three? Oh, sorry. Any board comment on section number three? Seeing none. Any public comment on section number three? Okay, why don't we move to section number four? And we're scrolling. <laughs> 224. Hmm? Yes, the public has this in their um, binder copy that's provided outside, as well as posted to the website for those watching on the webcast. Okay, starting at page 224 of your combined package for PDF, section four, the licensing program. Are there any board comments on this section? My comments in section five. Okay. Anyone for section four? Any public comment on section four? I would say this is going more expeditiously than I expected, but whenever I say that, we get lost. Why did you? <laughs> <laughs> Eve jinxed it. It's good to see we're so scientific on the board of psychology. <laughs> Where does section five start? 236. 236? Line 375 for those on the public okay. conference. Okay. Are we taking them on section five? We are now on section five. Dr. Harp Sheets, I believe you had a comment on this I section. I do. Um, on page 245 of the combined packet. Um, and let's see. Line 623 starts, how is sight and fine used? What types of violations are the basis? And, um, you know, the other, uh, the other situation is if there's a violation of probationary requirements. And it, I didn't see that sort of fitting 
into the ones that are uh, the examples that are given. And I know it says limited, not limited to the following, but since that comes right. up not, not infrequently, mm -hmm. I wondered if you wanted to add that. And just to clarify, you're looking at uh, question number 45, what are the five most common? 43. No, 43. Oh, 43. Okay, uh -huh. sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. Would you like to add a violation of probation to mm -hmm. the list? Yes, a vi violation of probationary conditions. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes unclear to me because it what you've what we've said here is a site and fine is used for cases that do not warrant formal discipline mm -hmm. if somebody is already in the situation of a formal discipline mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to flow or make sense mm -hmm. and well, even though do. that yeah. is one of the things that might happen so i'm just Right. And in the case of a violation of a condition of probation, that is a formal discipline. It is a tool of formal right. discipline in the case of probation right. violation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but they're not being formally disciplined additional, additionally beyond the already formal discipline. They're just receiving a sight and fine. Is it a sight and fine or is it a, I mean, what is it? Is it it's a, a citation? citation and fine. And fine. for okay. violating probation. Um, I actually agree with Dr. Horn, and I do think that it would be better maybe to add it to 45 as mm -hmm. one of the most mm -hmm. common types of okay. sign fines. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we're in sixth with six instead of five bullet points, though. Do we have it? Where did you say to add it? I'm sorry. Number 45. No, number 45. But they asked for five. Well, we can there. just take, when we put them in the order, that ah. I think are kind of most important. So we could take off failure to maintain proper record keeping mm -hmm. and add um, you know, violation of violation probation. Of Sorry, mm -hmm. quick, you said these are the five um, most, common. Most, common. most common. So in theory, probation violation is not one of the five most common. It, it is actually one of the oh. most common uses for citation and fine oh, okay. you know, for violating probation. So I, would, I think we definitely should include it in 45 and leave 43 as written. Got it. Mm -hmm. so and, and it's your suggestion to remove the failure to maintain proper record keeping from out of those five that are already in the list. Correct. Thank you. Um, but um, just for clarification, does the viol the violation uh, terms and conditions of probation is that does that happen often because of poor record keeping? No. No, and if you looked at the overview of enforcement activity that is part of agenda item 25, mm -hmm. you'll see over the years the increase in citation and fines. And ever since we started issuing cite and fines for probation violations, that number has increased tremendously. So, um, no, but it is not for poor record keeping. Usually it could be um, failure to pay cost recovery. Um, there's, there's certain things that could be a violation, but it is usually not for poor record keeping. Okay. And what was the intention between failure to maintain proper record keeping? Is that proper record keeping on behalf of the person that's on probation or on our behalf? For 45? For 45. This I, doesn't I, have anything really to do with probation. So when enforcement issues citations after investigating a case, it could be that the individual um, failed to maintain proper record keeping and we discovered that through our investigation. So it is something that we issue a citation and fine for. I think so she's rather than going through formal discipline with the individual, we use a citation and fine for lesser offenses. 
That's correct. And we usually wouldn't formally discipline someone for fail failure to maintain proper record keeping. It really just depends um, how egregious it was. So usually that's resolved through a citation and fine. Okay. So are there any other comments on this particular section? We did swap out that language. So the fifth common, most common violation now reads, violation of the terms and conditions of probation. Okay. Any further comments on this section from the board? Any comments from the public? Dr. Linda Crow? Hi, uh, Dr. Joe Linda Crow, the California Psychological Association. It's just a question on number, I think it's 38B. Um, wait, yeah. The average dollar amount of settlements reported to the board. Could someone explain what that means? Sandra? Ms. Monterubio, would you like to come up and respond? This is on failure to report once. So 38 is on mandatory reporting requirements and failures to report and the potential costs. Yeah, I, I believe that is just the settlements um, that are reported if an individual has been sued and they've reported that to the board. It's that amount that we're talking about. So above a certain dollar threshold, the, the amount of the settlement has to be reported to the board. Correct? Correct. Okay. And that's the average? Yes. And the dollar threshold in this one is 30000 30, That's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and just to point out that I, because we have so few of these cases, the average looks um, artificially inflated. So it's not that we get a lot. And this is the average. Um, I want to say there were a handful, like two or three. Or something. I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but it was a it was a very small amount. Yeah. So the should, committee should be asking for the median, not the average, from a statistic point. Of view. We don't come on in questions. Yeah, I know. Just answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any further comment on this section? Any further public comment? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Phillips. Can I can I just um, I, I was looking at a different issue just before this, so I missed uh, section 21 or question number 21. Sorry, not section number 21. I just want to get some clarification. Hopefully, you didn't already talk about it. it says the, the denials based on criminal history. Does this mean any time there was a denial or an outright denial that then resulted in uh, possibly a, a decision to issue the license. What page is that on the combined? Uh, Sandra? 227. <laughs> Why do you stay, stay up, up here? here? Come yeah. on. Yeah. Come on down. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. And I'm trying to scroll to look for the questions. This is mm -hmm. line 934 of the report. Question number 21. 227 in the combined packet. And, and I'm sorry, Noreen, what, what was your question again? The, just, the, just the question is, were these denials that uh, were issued that ended up being outright denials or all, all the denials that may have also then resulted in a license being issued? I just wasn't sure if we wanted to clarify that these were people who never got li applicants who never got licensed or applicants for whom there may have been a denial but then were subsequently licensed possibly on probation. I, I believe these individuals were denied and then it resulted in a statement of issue. So okay. it wasn't like a flat out denial. Okay. Um, it, speaking of that, on line number 947, it says, uh, fiscal year 2015 slash 17. Should that be 16? No. no good catch. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
so I have another question based on that. So if, if uh, based on Ms. Marx's clarification, so now it's clear to us, but is this clear to who's going to be looking at this? And do we need to clarify this? <clears throat> or should we say initial denials made? Right. But then it's going to trigger the question of if that's initial, then what happens after? Mm. Well, we can answer the question, or we can put we can put a longer explanation. I think sometimes with these statistics, the longer the explanation gets, the more meaningless the yeah. number seems. Yeah. But we could say denials based on criminal history in which an accusation was issued or filed. So they're just. Uh, Th these questions come from their committee, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to go exactly by these questions. But yeah. sometimes I don't think it's very clear then mm -hmm. what this means. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think we ought to. Is the category of denials based on criminal history their category? Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't think we should change it, though. Yeah, they it. Don't, it is not helpful when we start to alter their format. I'm not saying to change their categories. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, do we, what does that mean when they're asking that question? Each instance of denial and acts the board determined were substantially related. So, so denials based on criminal history came first, then circumstances. What do these numbers in parentheses mean after their names? Two T U. Yeah, there were two, two DUIs. DUIs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is the reasoning. Uh, but so I don't know. Are they wanting to know what the ultimate thing is, or I, I mean? So I think the question I, I would um, ask the board is if do you think it would be helpful, say, after, say, right around line 945, after you've given the statistics on the, there you go, thank you, on uh, denials based on criminal history, would it be helpful to say uh, these are initial denials in some cases um, applicants would have been issued subsequently issued a license. I, I, I am going to go back to the point I just made. When they ask us for specific information, we should give them the specific information they asked for. They will ask us follow-up questions after they receive our report. And if they want us to go into that particular explanation of why we have so many or what does that mean, mm -hmm. I think that's the place to do it. Mm -hmm. But when they give us categories and specific numbers they want, I don't think they're looking for footnotes and explanations. In fact. I, I, with all due respect to the legislative consultants who I think do a wonderful job, they're probably going to be irritated with us for giving long explanations of each category when that's not what they're asking for. So I think just from a matter, of, as a matter of politic, give them what they're asking for, and if they have further questions, we'll be happy to answer those mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Would well, you they, disagree, Ms. Monterubio? No, I think that, that's a good idea. I think as you, we read down and we talk about the, sort of the process, and then it says denials again, on line uh, 14, combined packet 228, um, then it, it appears that a full denial was really just number one person out of those five in 2015-16. That's with relation to self-disclosure of criminal history, though. It's fairly specific in that mm -hmm. instant. It's That's a subcategory. Yeah. Right, right, right. Thanks. Yes. Okay. I'm okay with it. And, and it's not that it's not my it's my natural inclination to give too much explanation or more explanation or sometimes too much explanation. But I just think in this circumstance, I think it would be mm -hmm. it would not be to the benefit, and I don't think the legislature would appreciate it. Mm. <laughs> just as long as you guys know what what the answering. And okay. and even if this were to come up at the hearing on sunset, the managers of the respective departments will be there, and they will be able to explain mm -hmm. uh, in more detail what the what the statistics are. Okay, any more comments on sec section five? Is that what we're on? Five? 
Oh, actually, we went backwards, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So now we're on section. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that little detour. <laughs> okay. Uh, section number six. Someone want to get what page do you have? 247. 247. Okay. Page 247 of the combined PDF. Public information policies. Comments from board members. Didn't we highlight wanting to talk about number 59? Mm -hmm. That's what we're not there yet. That's oh, section 7 right? Hearing no comments from the board, are there any public comments on section number six? Okay, section number seven is online practice issues, and this is something the committee wanted to bring back to the board. Um, it's a little unclear what they're talking about when they refer to online practices. If they were talking about online practices, they could be talking about the type of apps that are being developed to do psychotherapy or to find a psychotherapist or through which you can get 15 minutes of therapy. Um, they could be talking about the use of online resources for purposes of conducting telepsychology. Um, it's not entirely clear to us what they're asking. Um, and all that we've really taken any action in is in the area of telepsychology. So we're suggesting that the response focus on telepsychology rather than focus on things that we haven't gotten into. Um, but we did want to give you our thought process behind our response to, to question number 59. Any comments from board members? I wonder if this question is here because they're looking for us to guide, like if there's an emerging technology like apps or those types of things. And I, I wonder if there might be an opportunity to uh, preview of maybe if there's an emerging area or area of interest. I'm not, I'm not f personally familiar with these apps, but I do uh, recognize that there is a growth of, um, in the uh, technology area and new ways of using um, technology to do a lot of different things. Um, so I just, I just wonder if this might be an opportunity to to mention those if if they're emerging or relevant. I think it would it would be difficult for us to do that given that the board has not done any in-depth study of the particular topic nor have we come to any conclusions about what we think would be best from a policy point of view. So I think it would be kind of to speculate what the other things the the legislature ultimately might want us to regulate in the area. I don't want to kind of just put out an issue for purposes of information. And I, I think the other thing would be is that our board has not had complaints regarding these issues just yet. Mm -hmm. So if we had seen an uptick in complaints regarding those kind of apps and things and we were seeing an emerging trend in that, that might be worth talking mm -hmm. about. But since we don't actually have that just yet, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, something we haven't, yeah, we haven't broached the subject. We're not seeing an enforcement. And most of the questions we're receiving aren't based on the apps. They're much more of the telepsychology questions that we're fielding. And many of, and a lot of the policies we develop are kind of enforcement driven. Um, okay. Yeah. So unless we have a reason to develop a policy in an area, we don't kind of get it. As you say, cart horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a, a, this is just a teeny little thing, line A66. It's question number 63, invited to present their credentials mm. review process. Should be an S on credential. That's, that, oh, that's section eight? Oh, did I move ahead? Yeah, the sorry. section seven was only that one question. Oh, okay. It's confusing, okay, I know. Okay, sorry. Any, um, any further board comment on the one question in section seven? 
Well, in section seven, it appears there are um, two questions. And it looks to me like the wording that's chosen is a somewhat limited response. And I'm, because you're not answering, do we believe there's a need to do so? One could say yes, and one could say no. I'm just wondering if the thought behind that is what you've said before, that it's better to give less information than more, unless it's very specific? Well, I think we want to be responsive to the questions that are being asked. Mm -hmm. We don't generally volunteer information beyond, beyond what's being asked because mm -hmm. they've already got so much information to go through. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like writing an exam where you volunteer mm -hmm. too much information and right. then you get yourself off on a whole other tangent. So um, it would. I, I think what we're trying to do is be as responsive as we can based on what we know. I think it is... Um, are, are we having questions about online practices really addressed kind of in that mm -hmm. first sentence? Mm -hmm. The second one says what we're doing in the area of technology and mm -hmm. internet-related mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. um, they may send us back a question of what do you think should be done about apps or whatever, but the, the, we'll let the legislature kind of drive that particular bus. Would this be appropriate to put in here that the board is looking into... I'm just thinking of the request from the outreach committee about developing guidelines, asking. Um, I, I'm a little hesitant on that because that's more of an individual licensee's use of social media mm -hmm. and kind of their behavior around that versus online practice, which in my mind, I keep going back to delivery of services. Yeah. Um, we had talked about at the committee level putting in maybe a simple definition as the board considers online practice delivery of services pursuant to and then referencing the statute where it talks about um, telehealth. I, I think that's as general and broad um, and because we are at the stage where we're going through the regulatory process for uh, telepsychology. It, it seems just too early to say anything more about the issue. Um, those are just kind of my two cents, but I, I don't think it would hurt to put just a that kind of initial, how we look at defining online yeah. practice yeah. at our board. Yeah, we could put in, yeah, that would make it be helpful. Because the use of that term, as uh, Ms. Burns is doing this, the use of that term, I, I'm sure they had something specific in mind when they asked the question. Pursuant to, uh, pursuant to section uh, 2290.5 of the code related to telehealth. And then they can wordsmith yeah. from there. But I just wanted to put something out as how we look at online practice is we consider it at this stage the delivery of psychological services via electronic means. And just for those of you that are wondering about lunch, I would like to try to finish this report before we go to lunch. Uh, it may be possible to do that. It may not. If we go more than a half an hour, then we'll, I'll call it for lunch. Uh, oh, oh, people need to check out. Yeah. Oh, well, in that case, I guess it's lunchtime. Um, so we're going to resume with section number eight of this report after lunch. It is now approximately 12.07. You're pointing at something. I don't know what you're pointing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll go back to section number seven. Okay. Um, so uh, why don't we get back together at 108? Um, we were on section seven of online practice issues in the Sunset Report, uh, and I believe that we were waiting. We were going to open up public comment.
Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Elizabeth Winkleman at the California Psychological Association. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, in terms of the prevalence of online practice, that uh, we get it's probably one of the most common questions that comes up at uh, CPA among our members. And I, as we've discussed, I'm sure that's only going to continue to grow. And what I wanted to mention in terms of the um, potential need for regulations and guidance is that it's not simply uh, audiovisual psychotherapy by psychologists who are licensed in California, which is, I think, the focus of the proposed regulatory package, the regulatory package that's going through, but that now there's really been increasing use of, like, text therapy, apps, also people who are not licensed in California providing some kind of psychology-related service to patients who are in California. So I just wanted to um, mention that in the context of this question. Is there any further public comment? Seeing none, we're going to move on to Section 8, Workforce Development and Job Creation. Is there any board comment on section number eight? I think Jackie did. Any public comment on section number eight? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to section number nine. Current issues. Um, the only thing I have is on number 66, the word boards should be capitalized. On what line? Oh, uh, eight nine six. That's the question that's from the committee. So it's yeah. We don't, we don't edit their it. questions. Oh, that's how they, that's exactly that's how they, how they it. did that's it. That's how they wrote it. Oh, yeah. sorry. I yeah. thought I thought we typed this. No, there's a lot of this report that's actually not editable. Got it. Um, for instance, there's material that we pick up from the last report at their request mm -hmm. to put in this report so they can streamline their process. Mm -hmm. But all we can't change the text at all, even if we oh. want to. I just thought we typed it. No. Sorry. No. Okay. Any other comment on section number nine, current issues from the board? Any public comment on section nine? <coughs> Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to section 10, board action and response to prior sunset issues. This is an example of an area in which we are verbatim picking it up from a past report. So we can't now modify it if we think it's grammatically incorrect or whatever, even though I spent a lot of time on the plane doing it uh, at one point. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing we can re we can really deal with here is uh, if there's an update box at the end, mm -hmm. then the text in the update box is editable. Okay, so that being said, is there any comments on, is this 10? Mm -hmm. Wow, we're getting there. So this is what, the, this whole section. Like, Microphone. Oh, sorry. This whole section is their committee's write up about our stuff from what we had sent them last time, correct? It's a com combination of our responses from the last sunset report right. and their questions. So all we've done is fill out the update box from the last review okay. to now. What is the update on this particular subject? Okay. And then the only other thing is, um, I think on one of them there's a corresponding table that is also an update. So aside from the update box, there's one table that's also been updated, and that's up on the screen. So some of the text is stuff that we have written in the past, right? Right. But we can't change now. I know. Yeah. yeah. I know. Notice that it goes when against I... my grain. <laughs> can't rewrite history. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. We, yeah, we can. <laughs> Apparently. Um, we try to. We can try. To. Yeah. Um, so, is there any comments on any of the update boxes or the tab chart? The chart. Okay, so no board comment on any of these particular items? Okay, 
Um, and you'll see that there are certain places where words are highlighted because they need to be, those are data points that need to be confirmed as we get closer to finalizing the document. Is that correct, Ms. Burt? That is correct. So uh, towards the end of this process, I will go ahead and update all the bills where those ones are and the regulations. Um, because by then we will have moved a couple into the initial review phase with DCA instead of the informal review with our legal counsel. Okay. Moving on to section 11, new issues. Um, are there any board comments on this section? Do we have any public comment on this section? And we did uh, go through the issue of delegation authority for the licensure committee. That will be at line 355 on page 261 of the combined package. And is that language consistent with, has it been written in anticipation of the fact that we're going mm -hmm. to make the change? Okay. So we feel comfortable with the language. I do. Okay. That's why we had to take them out of order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to look presumptuous, right? Um, okay. <laughs> so, and it, is there any, seeing no board comment, is there any public comment on Section 11 of the Sunset Report? Okay. Moving to the final section, attachments. Uh, I'm just going to ask if anybody has any comments on the attachments collectively. A number of the attachments are, in reality, existing documents or are reports that were generated by the Department of Consumer Affairs. So they are not um, things that we are in a position to alter. And then we would also state that you'll take up the Administrative Procedure Manual at your February board meeting. So that will get updated, just not in time for this sunset report. Ms. Cervantes, was this where you saw your name not appearing in certain things? Was this? No. Uh, no, it was on an earlier section. But um, you, was it on the organizational chart? No, it was up at the up at the top. Let me see. I lost my place. But that could be. Um, that just, would just be an edit to add me if it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate, then Does this right. We don't need a go through all that detail right I th now. I think the only reason why your name may not be included mm -hmm. in a certain section was because you weren't appointed at that particular moment in time, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. Are you referring to where all of the board members are listed in their meetings and attendance? Because you're listed on page five. What, what page is that on the combined report? Um, 199. It goes through every past five years board members and their attendance, and you are listed. Okay. I'll, I'll, I didn't um, put a tab on it, so, so I'll, if, if, it, if there's an edit, there's an edit, right? Yeah, if you could, if you could just mm -hmm. let staff know if you yeah. did find a place where you feel like you should be mentioned, I'm sure they'd be happy to incorporate that change. And you'll be Thank seeing you. this, again, you'll be seeing this document mm -hmm. again at the telephonic meeting on November 8th. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. So any comments on the attachments? Section 12. Uh, from the board, from the public? Okay. And we will be revisiting the organization, or the um, administrative manual in the new year, as Mr. Fug mentioned. So I think that brings us to the end of item number 24, which brings us into item number 24. Yeah, I'm so confused. We're gonna do, we are going to do enforcement report, right? Um, why don't we do the presentation by Gloria? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, why don't we skip ahead to item number 26, which is the presentation by the Office of Attorney General. Uh, we are fortunate to have Ms. Castro here with us today uh, to uh, help us to better understand the clear and convincing evidence standard. Um, also, just so people are aware, we are going to be marking and videotaping this particular explanation to include, along with some other items as it relates to the enforcement report, but we'll get to that later. But just, just to know that this is going to be watchable for a long period of time on our website. 
<laughs> Not to put any pressure on you. <laughs>
in our office. We have about 60 of us um, statewide, and they are all supervised by nine supervising deputy attorney generals. This evidence review and assessment process involves our review of expert reports. And um, again, the subject matter experts that draft these reports are provided training uh, by you um, to make sure that they're adequately uh, assessing not only the evidence of the case, but properly applying the facts to laws, regulations, codes of conduct, and ethical principles. At the same time, um, these experts um, review some evidence, but we end up as prosecutors reviewing every single shred of paper that's in that report of investigation. So our DAGs, our Deputy Attorney Generals, are reviewing witness statements, patient records, and interviews of recipient witnesses. We're identifying case strengths, weaknesses, and sometimes missing evidence. We ensure throughout this process that we have the admissible evidence and reliable evidence necessary to be able to prevail in representing you. And we often discuss the drafts of our accusations with the subject matter experts to make sure that our deputies are understanding the technicalities. Because while we are prosecutors and attorneys first, and we may know your area of uh, practice very well, we're going to rely on that expert. And it's that expert that's going to be in the so-called hot seat, representing you, saying what your values are and what your expectations are to be able to execute the duties of your honorable profession. And ultimately, um, our DAGs are also not only assessing this evidence, but they're looking at jurisdictional issues and also assessing the availability, availability of witnesses and how well they can recall the events in question. And also assessing whether the subpoena authority that you have is sufficient to bring those people in, whether willingly or if we have to subpoena them. Um, ultimately, this is the case that I think um, really describes the marching orders for Department of Consumer Affairs uh, licensing, accusation, decision making, that our Attorney General's office does on your behalf. And Edinger versus Medical Board, uh, and the citation is 135 Calap 3rd, 853, describes essentially the clear and convincing to a reasonable certainty uh, standard applicable to licensees. The thought, of course, is that a licensing, um, a license is a property right. And generally, when there are specific educational and testing requirements to obtain a license, disciplinary charges must be proven by a clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty. And while we're showing you some of the quotes from Edinger versus Medical Board, which is an old case, but it's been interpreted by other case law and developed further, um, this is not the the end all and be all of the, how we address um, our discretion. We're also looking at the law, all the definitions of what uh, it means to be dishonest and corrupt, all that developing case law throughout these years and published cases. So it's not only the evidence we're looking at, but we're also looking at our ability to prevail in front of um, the subsequent triers, which ultimately you hold the keys way at the end. You're the ones that review all these proposed decisions, proposed stipulations, but they also need to meet muster before your eyes. Now, the evaluation of the evidence for prosecution suggests that um, sometimes when we're reviewing these cases, we identify if there are additional avenues for evidentiary development. And in those cases, we may request additional investigation. So when we're pushing this rock, we might say, well, this, is, this, this, this rock is going to need a little bit more to get it over this hump. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to get to the filing. But sometimes when the evidence is insufficient and further investigation is not recommended or legal issues prevent the prosecution of the case, we will decline the prosecution. Either way, we're still having this discussion with, with our client. She receives all of our letters, all of our recommendations, whether it is to recommend the filing, recommend further investigation, recommend a filing 
an investigation to maybe make the case, add more components to the case, or to outright reject it. And I believe that that is um, sometimes, uh, those are the most difficult discussions uh, to have because we are talking it through and we are trying to assess these things. And so part of your agenda always has been, um, especially around now where we're in October, you're looking at legislation. Our office is actually the end consumer of a lot of this legislation and, and, and defending that legislation and how we read certain things sometimes it's through these discussions with these cases that we can't move forward on that we come up with ideas for potentially um, addressing some deficiencies and what's there. Or case law sometimes. Sometimes there's cases that come out and we, you, we encourage the boards to determine a way to uh, address the outcome and see what happens. So this is just a illustration of the burdens of proof uh, preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, uh, in order to take disciplinary action against a licensee, as I said, uh, it's not going to be beyond a reasonable doubt. When we're discussing beyond a reasonable doubt, we're talking about denying someone their liberty. Um, that's incarceration, that's criminal law, that's that land. We also don't live in the land of preponderance of the evidence. That's civil work, civil cases. And um, preponderance of the evidence does not apply to folks who already have attained the licensing right, have that piece of property, and it's going to take a little bit more evidence to be able to prevail. At the same time, um, the evaluation of the case for prosecution entails uh, very detailed assessment of facts to be able to make it fit with, between this clear and convincing standard. We must satisfy ourselves that not only is it enough, but that we will prevail because we certainly don't want to file cases that are ultimately going to have to be withdrawn or dismissed. We want to make sure that we put your name, Ms. Oreck's name, and ultimately your name on something that is really protecting the public and managing the evidence before it, before us. And again, as I mentioned, if something is not going to pass muster, we will review it and return it for more investigation and engage in more discussions with our client. Now, the accusation is uh, ultimately the goal right here. Um, can, we can we propose an accusation to our client that she can um, sign, and then that is the vehicle that puts the public on notice of what this licensee has done. And it, importantly, it also tells the licensee what his or her board believes they fell short on. Now, Government Code Section 11503 further describes this legal proceeding, and that is the accusation proceeding. Now, the entire process is governed by the Administrative Procedures Act, and that is found at the Government Code Section 11500. And if one reads that carefully, that is where the right to an adjudicative hearing is granted to the licensees. And as you all are aware, we prosecute all of these actions before the Office of Administrative Hearings, if need be, or settle those cases that we can settle, either for probation or surrender. And before the Office, office of Administrative Hearings, um, this is the land of where we already are thinking, if we have to go to hearing, do we, is our evidence going to be sufficient? Um, because we're always actually preparing for the fact that the licensee has a right to fight what those charges are and will present experts on their behalf to support what they did. And so when we appear in front of Office of Administrative Hearings, we're exchanging discovery, reviewing their experts' opinions. And um, ultimately, it's going to be your role or the judge's role um, to decide. Um, well, actually, the judge makes a uh, proposed decision to you, and then you decide if the judge got it right with the evidence before him or her. We charge licensees with unprofessional conduct. Here's a list of all the different um, types of causes for discipline that we can file, quality of care, sexual misconduct, violations 
of the APA Code of Conduct and Ethical Principles of Psychologists. And almost all of these bullet points have case law behind it. So ultimately, because our folks back at the Attorney General's Office and the Health Quality Enforcement Section live and breathe this stuff, they, they eventually will know whether the case has it or not. And we will engage in, as your partner to make sure that we get it right and file the cases that need to be filed on your behalf and ultimately protect the public and allow the licensee to rehabilitate him or herself. Because ultimately, these cases are not being filed to punish our licensees. They're being filed where possible to rehabilitate them, show them where they uh, fell short, and in cases that are very serious, then the ultimate outcome is, is a revocation and a timeout. And so that concludes my presentation, and I'm open to hear any questions that you may have. This may be asking you to repeat yourself, but could you one more time give us the legal definition of clear and convincing evidence? Yes, clear and convincing evidence uh, to a reasonable certainty means that if you want to show the little slide with um, the different burdens, it's somewhere between beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning that the weight of the evidence is such that that's how heavy our burden is to bear because we're going to deprive someone of their liberty. And then at the other end, preponderance of the evidence is 51%. So it just has to be enough clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty. And it's, it's somewhere in the middle. And so prosecutorial discretion is going to take into account all of this evidence and make a decision like, is this evidence enough to show what the expert's opinion is, for example? The expert has said this person has uh, engaged in dishonest and corrupt acts. <coughs> we have some evidence. And we're matching the evidence to what we're trying to prove that this person fell short on. Um, it's 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 a concept that applies individually to each case. So boards, we operate on a case-by-case -case basis with each licensee because you're never going to have a patient presenting exactly the same to the same professional. And it's very indicative of what what is the mindset of the licensee at the time that they decided to treat this person a certain way. So that's all the evidence that we're trying to collect. Um, and then applying that evidence to the expert opinion that describes in full the law or the ethical concept that they have fell short on. And then ultimately the attorney is matching all those three things and trying to come up with A, charges, and B, charges that we can sustain and live with. Uh, for filing and to put your name on it. It's a very, very serious um, thing um, that happens to licensees and we take it very seriously, but we will file the cases that need to be filed um, if they meet that burden. So putting it in lay terms. Yes. Um, preponderance of the evidence, is it just has to be a little bit more evidence. 51%. In favor of the proposition than against the proposition. Yes. Beyond a reasonable doubt to take somebody's liberty away or perhaps take their life away, mm -hmm. you need to prove pretty much certain that it's that it's happened mm -hmm. and this is the way it went down. People can't have a reasonable doubt about it. That's right. Clear and convincing evidence is a very high hurdle to get over relative to a simple civil suit. Right. It really means that there has to be a substantial tip in the mm -hmm. direction of uh, the accusation, which makes it a much more difficult burden for the board and for you to satisfy in an administrative proceeding because you are removing a property right. Absolutely. And so um, that in a nutshell is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. And again, we appreciate that when it comes to a case that's not filed, that there's always going to be questions about what happened. And we are not at liberty usually to be able to fully discuss what what we didn't see or what wasn't there. And again, because we don't have presidential decisions, we have a few here and there, different boards uh, have the ability to do that. 
we are treating each case as an individual basis. Here are the laws and regulations and codes of conduct and ethics that you are bound by as a professional in the state of California. Here's your patient, and here's the, the world of not only your qualifications and experience, which you're always applying as a professional to the patient in front of you, but the patient brings in evidence as well, and there's also percipient witnesses. There's the lay of the land of uh, how many years did they treat? Was it a one-time deal? Did they meet with this person for many, many years? You're taking as much as possible into consideration to be able to assess the case plus the expert, right? So we don't just proceed because we're gonna proceed. We, we really are counting on that expert to be able to explain it to the judge and explain it to the other side and to be able to prevail as well. So we, we, we critically analyze those expert opinions. We will meet with our experts to the extent necessary to make sure that we understand the technicalities and that they also read the evidence in a way that, that is admissible and reliable. Sometimes for our complainants, I'm sure you've had this experience, it's difficult for them to understand that in addition to whatever evidence they've given us, mm -hmm. the licensee's given us evidence, and there are other considerations at work. The strength of the expert te uh, opinion, uh, whether you can meet the clear and convincing evidence standard, and so on and so forth. So sometimes because it kind of goes into a black box, it's a little hard to see from the outside the justification for why the decision is being made not to pursue a complaint. That's right. It's, and I think it's fair to say on behalf of the board, it's not because it's not taken seriously. It's mm -hmm. because it just is not going to get get us to where we need to go if we want to, to bring an enforcement action. That's right. And that's why um, sometimes in, in managing these cases, we identify things that are maybe vague, and how something is phrased or improvements that can be made in a reg and to avoid um, a case in the future that maybe we didn't get over the hump because there's a jurisdictional issue or there's something missing structurally, not maybe in the case, but obviously these are very, very important decisions. We take our prosecutorial discretion very, very seriously and not all cases will ultimately be filed. Some will be returned for more investigation some of them will be filed with what we have and maybe not as strong as we could have made them. So there will be also charges that won't get filed. So that's another common question. You, you will do the filing, but then people don't understand, well, why didn't you file it this way? Why, what is missing there? Um, and those are all discussions that obviously we're bound by confidentiality, privacy. Um, there's a deliberative process as well. Uh, not being able to explain exactly what we saw um, and ultimately the tension between public protection on the one hand and the licensee's right to practice his or her profession after much testing, schooling, and all that. And ultimately the, the bigger goal of rehabilitating is not supposed to be punishment. Um, it feels like punishment, I'm, I'm sure of it. As a licensed professional, if the state bar ever, it, 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 would, it would feel like punishment, but it's not supposed to be punishment. It's supposed to let you come back, right? And, and so there's, that's why, at the same time, that's another question is, well, that's why you're not out forever and ever. That's why when the board says, you're revoked, you can always try to come back in and petition for a reinstatement. So I think that's the other side of the coin. That's why folks can come back and they're not out forever and ever. So I don't want to say it this way, but there's no other way to say it. There's no death penalty to your license holding either for the same exact reasons. So um, we appreciate the question and we appreciate the, the concerns. And, and um, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's a common question of any prosecutor's office. Um, and when it comes to health, uh, the health of Californians and, and how they relate to professionals, um, we, these documents do put the public on notice of, of licensees, as well as fellow licensees. You know, we all do read those disciplinary outcomes, and those provide learning opportunities. So sometimes we look, don't appreciate that in going into these cases, we're actually having a rehabilitative effect that sometimes is not tangible 
you can't identify how many people read that decision and realize, ooh, I'm doing it that way. Maybe I shouldn't anymore. But, but there's that outcome as well. That is also public protection. And it's very important and intangible, but it works. Are there any further questions from board members? Um, actually, like my original question has something to do with those um, with those that are don't rise enough to uh, to an accusation because that's usually um, like uh, there's a complainant and mm -hmm. they receive a letter that says that there's not enough yes. um, evidence to to pursue. Um, pursue this further or something to mm -hmm. that effect. They yes. receive that letter and then they always feel like it's somehow on them that they didn't present enough evidence on whatever they submitted and it wasn't taken seriously. So um, I, you've explained a lot that there's a lot of things that go into mm -hmm. into the investigation and that both sides present um, evidence. Um, but I was just thinking, I just want to comment that that's one of the things that we see is that um, the complainant feels that, you know, if, if there is there anything else that they can do or, or to kind of like bolster their, their kind of like um, initial complaint. Right. I think uh, the fact that they brought the complaint says a lot about the person. So they should always feel like they should be able to file complaints. They should always know that this board and all the other boards at Department of Consumer Affairs look at every single complaint that comes in very seriously and um, send those to investigation that should be sent to investigation. The fact that the, uh, they provided everything is a, is a good fact. I mean, everything should be turned over that they have to present. They should be as cooperative as possible by signing releases for medical records, things like that. That helps the process. Um, the patient releases are very important, you know, and uh, being able to present these to the licensee uh, to be able to review the medical records is a critical component. And um, but getting the side of the story from the licensee is also the other component, like what was in their head and mind at the time they related with the, this patient, what facts were they operating on, because you give them the license, so. They're obviously qualified, but they're obviously also trusted to exercise their judgment on the patient's uh, welfare. And so there's always two sides to the story, and we value both sides. Uh, but it, ultimately, the expert who's in the middle, taking the patient side, taking the professional side, and coming up with an opinion based on the evidence and applying it to the code of conduct or ethics or whatever whatever is the marching uh, blueprint that we're looking at for what is wrong with this picture. You. You're welcome. Ms. Castro, um, yes, sir. I'm not an attorney, so I appreciate you indulging us um, with your answers and your thoughtfulness. Um, one of the questions I had was, um, does the, um, the occasion of multiple complaints from diff different individuals against one licensee naturally meet the clear and convincing evidence? And as a follow-up to that question, could be, I think, from a lay person, well, wait, if there's more than one person making a complaint, how come this doesn't meet the clear and convincing evidence? Could you explain why they, that may not necessarily be sufficient? So uh, what you're describing is uh, one licensee who has multiple complaints filed against him or her. And um, taking them globally is not going to work. You can't say, well, five people complained. Um, it all kind of sounds the same, so therefore there's five people out there that don't, don't agree with what this professional did to, in their care of them. It doesn't work that way. Each individual complaint needs to live and die on its own merits. Pattern and practice can be something you look at. So if over a period of time the professional is engaging in a pattern in practice. But those types of cases are not really how we operate. We operate on a case-by-case -case basis. If those cases all came in at the same time, I, I guess we, one deputy and one investigator and one expert could review all of them. But temporarily, if these things come in over a period of time, it's really up to 
the board and also what we see to address them. And there's also the statutes of limitation. So there's about 12 um, DCA clients um, that have statutes of limitation, others don't. So sometimes depending on who the client is, um, we could take an old complaint that maybe went nowhere and relook at it. But at the same time, it, that's not clear and convincing evidence. It's, it's not like here's a bunch of stuff against one person. It has to be individual and it has to rest and die on the ability of those records and those expert opinions to carry the day. So, um, and I apologize for misusing the term, um, there's no essentially class action quote unquote complaint, is that what I'm no, hearing? No, there, there's not. And um, again, pattern and practice is not really what we do. Um, we do look at each individual patient um, in case, uh, if they all come, like I said, if they all came in at this, in a kind of a tight period of time, then, you know, we could potentially get the same expert to review all those cases. but. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't have much more to say about that. Yeah. So it's not an additive process. In other words, mm -hmm. you could have several cases that maybe would satisfy preponderance of the evidence, but having five of those cases together does not make for clear right. and convincing evidence on any one of the complaints. Is that a fair way of putting it? I think so. On a separate note, um, with regard to patient releases, mm -hmm. um, so I just want to make sure I understood correctly that there have been instances where um, the, the complainant doesn't actually complete the patient release, and that actually ends up being an obstacle mm -hmm. to the pursuit of this case. Is that is that yes? Uh, just, okay, great. Thank you. Yes. That's helpful um, to understand. It's, it's very important to get a patient release. Um, it helps the investigator. Um, obtain the records as quickly as possible. Um, if a release is presented um, to a licensee, the expectation is that they will turn over the records. And so while we're saying the patient should sign this release and to allow the investigator to procure the records, same argument can be made to the licensee. It would be helpful as well. The licensees would turn over the records. But of course, licensees um, can certainly uh, inquire more of the process uh, at that point and, and decide that maybe they're going to uh, assert privacy interests of the patient and, and, and not be as agreeable in turning over the records. But uh, everyone has a responsibility to play. The licensee should really be, in my opinion, forthcoming with the board and, and provide his or her side of the story as well. And of course, as healthcare providers, we are trained not to turn things over mm -hmm. without either an order from the court, a subpoena, or a release. And the easiest way mm -hmm. for um, us to turn over those records is if we receive a release. That's right. And psychological records and also records of rehabilitation for drugs or, or, or of the utmost uh, privacy. I'm not saying that just the regular health care is not entitled to privacy. Yes, it is. But the law is very clear that psychological records and rehabilitation, HIV records, those are just, so you're absolutely right, doctor. Um, it is part of the training to, to look at it and say, well, I will turn it over, but show me something that tells me I can do so. Um, and so, yes, Mr. Fu, I think Patients that complain should be encouraged to complete the process so that there are no holds up, hold ups and trying to procure the evidence. And again, from a prosecutor's perspective, you want the evidence to be as fresh as possible. You want to be able to, to say if the patient says, and so-and-so was there in the room with me and they heard the psychologist tell me X, Y, and Z, you want to be able to, to get fresh evidence, find those witnesses, and interview them if you're an investigator uh, engaging in the evidence procurement. And um, their role in the process cannot be understated. Uh, investigators are very, very important to the process. They're the ones that earn the trust of the patients. They're, they're your eyes and ears, and, and they're walking around collecting this evidence for you, trying to procure the correct expert for the case, compiling an expert package to present to the expert so that the expert can make an adequate assessment based on the facts in the case to render an opinion. Any further questions or comments from the board members? That was with the microphone on. 
<laughs> um, is there any questions or comments from the public on this particular topic? Hi, Elizabeth Winkleman with the California Psychological Association. First of all, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, it really explained the, the burden of proof and the involvement of the, your office extremely well. Um, the one question that I wanted to ask is about the educational aspect mm -hmm. of the accusations and the publication of the discipline which comes out, of course, in the newsletter, in that, for example, earlier this year, and it was discussed at a previous meeting, there was a decision that was published um, that said that the licensee was uh, engaged in gross negligence for emailing a previous client. And when this was published, we there was a huge amount of concern mm -hmm. that was expressed by many psychologists who are members of our organizations because, in fact, commonly people do with proper um, consent or security procedures email with patients and with private patients uh, and with previous patients, I'm sorry. Now, of course, if the content of an email is inappropriate, that's a completely different story. If it had been an email saying, yes, and I'm going to ask you on a date next week as soon as, you know, that's different. So my question is, so when we brought this up previously, we were told that, yes, but there are, you know, all the details are confidential, and I understand that the details, many of the details must be confidential, but even in the language of the accusation itself, if part of it is for an educational purpose, so that, because psychologists want to do the right thing, obviously, you know, 99.9%, 99%, they want to help their clients, and they want to do the right thing, and they want to know what the rules are. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, um, if, if potentially more, uh, a little more detail might be included in some accusations so that they could fulfill that educational purpose as opposed to, in this case, for example, just raising a lot of concern and not being able to answer any questions about why that might have been considered gross negligence. So the system that we have in California on accusations is a notice pleading. And so ultimately, our dogs also are very cognizant of we have all the details and sometimes out of consideration of the licensee, the person involved, the way we draft things and their charges, okay, so at that point this is what we think we have. Um, I, I don't know that being more detailed would, would address the concerns because again remember when I said no case is ever the same? So even if you were super detailed you're never going to get that same patient saying that same thing. Um, but ultimately, what the expert reads um, and finds that there's gross negligence. And gross negligence is an extreme departure from the ordinary standard of care. Uh, so they're applying uh, a definition like that to what's in front of them. So yes, they did read the whole email. And perhaps the, what was contained in there, and I'm just throwing out an example, I'm not talking about that case, um, expressed some sort of boundaries issue or there was... Um, a general uh, unprofessional conduct flavor in the email that showed that an unfitness to practice medicine, uh, practice psychology or conduct which breaches the rules or ethical code of your profession or even conduct that is unbecoming of a member in good standing of a profession. And it's what that member of the community at large, so experts are members of the community that that licensee practices in. So it's it has to be the community making that judgment. And um, so there may be disagreement, like kind of how you're saying, it's like, well, how can I not be communicating with my patient? This is a good thing. And of course, you're absolutely right. No professional ever wakes up in the morning saying, I'm gonna go out and hurt somebody. No, they don't do that. They want to help. Um, but again, the educational component of it is, is something that is, is good food for thought. It's good food for uh, the board to continue to, to express where the where is the misunderstanding in this. So for example, in this agenda today, there will be a presentation on supervisors of psychological assistance. 
And that's like a perfect example of, okay, let's talk about this so everyone is very clear. So I don't believe that there wouldn't be a situation that someone might feel that the person got it right and, and, and they do it exactly like that person. But at the same time, I think that the, the thought process is in reading that and seeing what happens, hopefully there would be some outcome that somebody could avoid a similar situation or think about their practices. And that's public protection as well. Well, I, I do um, appreciate that, 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 that it would be inappropriate and impossible to, uh, to give a lot of details about mm -hmm. a specific case. And I don't want to overstep mm -hmm. my bounds in any way, but I guess I would just want, you know, even a few more words would have would help in a, in a situation like that. So for example, if it's inappropriate content of an email, the, the licensees don't need to know what was the exact nature of the inappropriate okay. content, but just to know that it wasn't just by virtue of having sent an email to a prior patient being grossly negligent. Being grossly negligent. And the comment is well sense. taken. It All absolutely right, makes you. sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any more comment? Well, Ms. Castro, we really appreciate you coming down and meeting with us and Absolutely. giving this pre presentation on clear and convincing evidence standard Anytime. the process. And we very much appreciate the work you do on the board's behalf Thank at you. the Attorney General's office. Thank and, you. And how closely you stay in touch with our management team to make sure that everything's running smoothly. So we Thank applaud you. you for your service to the state. And, and, and I applaud you for everything that this board does to protect everybody. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're now going to go not to the enforcement report because that is not an action item. We're trying to take the action items first in today's agenda. We're going to the enforcement committee report. Uh, there's a distinction there. Mm -hmm. um, which took me probably about two years to realize what the distinction was. Uh, and in particular, item number C, the child custody stakeholder meeting implementation, uh, which was the bulk of the discussion at the last enforcement committee meeting. So everyone should have received the hand carry item um, labeled child custody stakeholder meeting implementation plan. So at our last meeting, we, um, I'm sorry, at our April meeting, we talked about the five items um, that the committee was going to work with staff on um, based on the child uh, stakeholder meeting that we had September of 2018. And the five action items, which I will go over, are mandate child abuse, domestic violence, education for subject matter experts. Item two is screen child custody subject matter expert that subscribe to parental alienation. Three is educate the public on clear and convincing evidence. Four is create a complaint fact sheet. And five is review and consider statutory language related to documentation considered for child custody complaints. So at our last enforcement committee meeting, uh, in September, we talked about how we were going to implement these five items. So for item one, we are going to require that our subject matter experts take six hours of continuing education in child abuse and six hours in domestic violence every three years. And that's the term of their three-year contracts. Item two, um, on our expert application, we are going to include the following question. Do you believe parental alienation syndrome should be included in the DSM? Why or why not? And depending on the answer given, further review will be undertaken on a case-by-case -case basis. Can I get, sh sh sure. Um, item three. We add a definition of clear and convincing evidence. Um, I'm sorry, a, a definition of clear and convincing evidence is provided on the complaint fact sheet, which will be posted on the board's website. And in addition, the board will post a link to the presentation that you just uh, were provided by Senior Assistant Attorney General uh, Gloria Castro. And um, again, the link will be provided on the board's website under the consumer page. 
In regards to creating a complaint fact sheet, item number four, the committee amended the complaint fact sheet, which again will be posted on the board's website by early November. And for item five, this item is on the agenda for the enforcement committee and will be presented at a future board meeting. And the last column on the documentation that you received gives an implementation time frame of um, what we're looking at. So what we can do in 2019, again, is item three, and that's educate the public on clear and convincing evidence and to have the complaint fact sheet posted on our website. Um, we also have for item one and item two, which is the mandating child abuse and domestic violence uh, continuing education that will be implemented in 2020, which will be our next expert training in 2021, as well as screening for the child custody subject matter experts uh, that subscribe to parental alienation. Um, we will amend our application um, to be an expert and that will start in 2020. Are there any questions? So I have a question. I'm wondering uh, on our action items, because uh, I'm talking about number two. Mm -hmm. We have subscribed to parental alienation, but really you're talking about in your how to implement um, parental alienation syndrome. And I'm wondering if you could add that to the action item as well. Okay. Well, the action items actually came out of the child custody stakeholders meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were actually created in that report by consensus of the people in the room. When we started to discuss this, we really realized that obviously parental alienation is a phenomenon. One parent can alienate the other parent, but someone subscribing to the parental alienation syndrome is subscribing to something potentially that's outside the scope of what's accepted in exactly. psychological science. So. I agree with you. It would read better if it said uh, parental alienation syndrome, but I'm just not sure if we have the authority to change the original action item, or do we? No problem? Well, this is the time for the board to adopt or change any of the committee's recommendations. So okay. I, th I think that's what we're here to do. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's going to be my recommendation for exactly the same reasons that you said. I think it makes it less definitely less confusing and potentially heads off a lot of anxiety yeah. I think we can just make the amendment to it do we need to make a motion to approve the action item do you want to do that at the end sure. when you're done reviewing it just make one motion to approve the implementation plan okay Right, because I think this is all related to uh, item 27C, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So then you can take item 27C as a separate recommendation from the committee and then deal with the rest of the committee's report. Yeah, we're right. probably not going to get to the rest of the committee's report. Well, then that would probably be the whole of the committee's report. <laughs> <laughs> that was yes. all the committee report. <laughs> yeah, but we did just, definitely just want to get to this. Yeah. We had promised the advocacy community that we would be certain to, to get to this item in this... Uh, in this particular meeting, so uh, we did want to do that. Actually, do you want it? Does somebody want to go ahead and make a motion with that amendment mm -hmm. to adopt the, and then we can have more board discussion and then public comment? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to make that motion that uh, we adopt as amended, uh, and that would be adding syndrome after parental alienation under action items number two um, to the um, enforcement committee report. I second. Is there any more board discussion on this particular topic? On, yes. on the implementation plan? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. This is with, with um, regard to item number three where it says a definition of clear and convincing evidence is provided on the complaint fact sheet. Um, one of the, so I know we'll be linking out to um, Ms. Castro's presentation, um, but on the fact sheet itself is, what are you exactly posting on the, is it the, the Colorado v. New Mexico definition? Is it the link to the video? What, what do we mean by definition of, of that? So the question on the fact sheet says, what is clear and convincing evidence? And then Joshua Tomplay, our DAG liaison, provided the board 
for board staff the definition and we included that. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Sure. Any other board discussion on the motion? Any public comment? On the motion or the whole? The implementation plan. The motion is to adopt the implementation plan. So it would be anything related to the implementation plan. Hello. Um, I'm Dr. Joe Lindercrum, the CEO of the California Psychological Association, and Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman is the Director of Professional Affairs for the California Psychological Association. And we do have um, some comments to offer. I'll try to keep them um, as brief as possible and, and be very concise. Um, we have heard um, since the recent issue of the journal was published. I can't see the president. Let's get over. And then I can't see the executive office. Yeah. I like to look people in the eye. Um, since the journal was published that had the summary of the enforcement committee and the summary of the stakeholder meeting, we have heard from um, quite a number of your licensees uh, and uh, about their concerns about what they read. So I want to uh, just back up for a second and talk for a minute about a couple of things. Um, first is um, some concern we have around the stakeholder meeting itself. Secondly, then, um, we have some observations and some uh, concerns we'd like to share with you about item number one and item number two. Um, or is that right? Yes. Yeah. Item number one and item number two. Um, I guess vis-a-vis uh, -vis the stakeholder meeting, um, I think when the stakeholder meeting was discussed originally, and I'm not recalling at what board meeting or uh, how it came about. Um, I believe that we felt that it was not necessary that the California Psychological Association be included in that. It's possible that I, that I indicated that. I think uh, my understanding of that stakeholder meeting was that it was being described as a meeting to hear some concerns raised by the Center for Judicial Excellence around uh, issues about the courts, about the disciplinary uh, actions of the Board of Psychology, and perhaps about the chain of evidence, um, the, the evidence or the records that the board was eligible to receive and how they would play into any kind of decisions. And so none of those areas are areas that CPA really has the standing to weigh in on. Um, the meeting, as I understand it, or as I read from the, the summary of the report of the stakeholder meeting, turned out to be much broader than that and um, was um, a facilitated meeting. We did not receive a formal invitation to the stakeholder meeting. It looks like it was a facilitated meeting to actually triage and prioritize a list of uh, concerns and possibly a wish list that was provided to the board. And out of that came these recommendations. Um, we've learned from this, and I will say now for the record, that um, we would like for CPA to be considered a stakeholder in any meeting, any stakeholder meeting that has to do with anything that could be related to the licensure of psychologists. Um, and um, I'm, I regret that we weren't there. I'm, I regret if we indicated that we didn't want to be there, which we may have done. Um, and to that end, uh, I will put on the record that we would like to request that there be a follow-up stakeholder meeting around these issues um, that would include a broad set of stakeholders, including individuals who are experts 
in the field of child custody evaluations and uh, also the California chapter of the Association of Family Conciliation Courts. That would give the board a broad perspective on these issues, which we have learned over the past, I would say, two weeks, just how complicated this area really is. It is so complicated and uh, deeply complex. So that brings us to an easy one, I think, just to comment on, and that is um, number one on the implementation list. Um, in fact, the requirement for child abuse and uh, domestic training for those who work in this area, um, we want to be sure that you know, and I, I think the psychologists on the board certainly know that this is already a requirement. Um, child custody evaluators in California are required by the California Rules of Court to have 16 hours of domestic violence prior to ever evaluating a case. Uh, and they must take four hours of training in domestic violence that has been approved by the Judicial Council each year. We actually believe that only child custody evaluators who have been approved by the Judicial Council should serve as, as experts. Um, and we suggest that the requirement of the board to have these properly trained experts, um, we, we, it has raised concerns that not having experts uh, who understand that the training already exists or requiring this, this additional training is perhaps not necessary and we're curious uh, again about how this, how this came to pass. The biggest area of concern is number three that Dr. Horn has alluded to. And, uh, sorry, number two. Um, and that is the screening of expert reviewers in the area of um, the topic of parental alienation. And I'm so glad that you raised it earlier because um, certainly what I've learned over the past um, couple of weeks, I've spent a lot of time, and so has Dr. Winkleman on this issue, is really how important language really is in this area. So it is hugely important that the right words are used. So in the meeting summary in the journal, it says screen for parental alienation. That really is, I'm not sure what that would mean. In the minutes of the April meeting, again, uh, we didn't comment. And I'm here to say I wish we, we didn't. We did not recognize. Um, I don't think the psychologist members of the board recognized the, the, the potential implications of these recommendations. Dr. Horn did ask at that meeting, what does that mean to screen for parental alienation? Dr. Phillips, you said that it means to screen for those who adhere to parental alienation syndrome, but then added that, um, let's see, what were the words, um, and who take an active advocacy position on the concept of parental alienation. So again, uh, I, I, I realize this is in hindsight um, and in retrospect, um, but we have talked to so many of the experts in this field now who have really shown, have really pointed to again and again the nuances and the difference in, for example, having a knowledge of parental alienation theory and how that is very different from subscribing to the parental alienation syndrome diagnosis, if you will, which is not really a diagnosis. Um, many people who work in the field recognize these nuances. There are uh, conversations happening around this. The American Psychological Association has a work group that is actually working on this very topic to try and come up with some guidelines that would um, help um, people who are working in this area. Um, 
we're, we're not experts in this area, uh, but we now certainly realize how complex this is. Um, enough so that the no notion of screening potential content experts for this leads to some very serious questions about how will they be screened? Who is going to do the screening? The question that you're suggesting that you ask um, and the why or why not, and they're going to give an answer, and, and who is going to make the judgment then? Is it going to be staff who would be making that judgment on, on an issue like this that has such serious implications? Um, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to say a few words about this area, and then I'll just close it up, and we'll, be, we'll wrap it up. Hi, I think actually that uh, Dr. Linda Crow has done a great job of explaining the concerns that have been raised. I want to say that I've spoken at length with several psychologists who are experts in this area and really brought to my attention how difficult it is in working with these concepts on the and, and the sometimes lack of clarity and, and um, misunderstandings that can, that can come up in this area. On the one hand, the parental alienation syndrome, as defined by its uh, originator, Gardner, um, which is, I think, you know, many years ago, 30 years ago or so, and then the theory of alienation, and then that, uh, and the syndrome. Is, most people do not subscribe. Most um, uh, of the psychology community does not subscribe to the parental alienation syndrome. However. There are issues of alienation sometimes of some parents. There's issues of resist, refuse dynamics. There's issues of um, aligned parents and, and estrangement. And that all of these, there, there's some, uh, there's some uh, the definitions are not always clear, which is what raises the, con the concerns about how is this screening going to be implemented and who is doing it. Um, because our, what the experts have conveyed to me in particular is that this is a complex area and there are often multiple factors that will be involved in family dynamics and they are concerned that, they're, that if this screening is inappropriately applied, then people who are really very well regarded in the field and have a complex, uh, deep understanding of the latest literature and practices in high conflict families would potentially be screened out, or that they might, uh, or or that they, uh, in any case, need to be part of this discussion. And that's going to bring me back to what uh, Dr. Linda Crow's initial comments were, in that um, given these concerns about the uh, lack of uh, the complexity in this area, the lack of clarity in the definitions, and sometimes overlapping areas in the uh, in these complex, high conflict families that it would really be important. We would ask you to consider getting input from experts in this area and having a broader stakeholder input before actually implementing, in particular, uh, number two, uh, the, the second uh, action item. Right. And um, so let me just close by saying, and, and again, um, I certainly recognize and have learned a lot from this. I. I um, I know that we're asking the board to take a, a look back, and that's never an easy thing to do. And um, but just given the complexity of this and the implications um, in such an important area that affects families and children, we really urge the board to do just that, and that is take a step back regarding implementation. I know that these, um, these steps m may, on the face of it, look small. They may look like uh, fairly simple things to implement. But um, we just feel like it's, it was too important not to raise these issues. Um, specifically, we would ask that any implementation done um, would be in a very, very careful and very thoughtful manner, and ideally with the input from a broad array 
of uh, licensed psychologists uh, who work in this in this field, so that the board would benefit from having those perspectives. Um, this is where another stakeholder meeting or some other mechanism for getting that kind of input might be helpful. Um, we are just very concerned, for example, it, if, if it would be the staff that would have to do this screening, what a difficult position that would put staff in. Or if a person, I mean, and, and let well, me be maybe clear. Maybe you want to we, give us an opportunity to respond so sure. we don't have to revisit those Ab issues. Absolutely, yeah. It will be a former board member who will be reviewing those questions initially okay. and then maybe consulting with a child custody expert who already works as a subject matter expert if there needs to be more exploration of it. Um, and that will be in consultation with staff, but staff will not be making the decision based on that question. Okay. So that should give some comfort, I think, to licensees who may want to apply to be child custody experts. We don't exactly have a stampede of people that want to apply to be child custody experts, so subject matter experts. So I'm not sure this is really impinging a large part of your membership, but we did want to be clear in our use of language. And I agree that parental alienation in and of itself is almost meaningless because it can mean, right. can parental alienation happen in a family? Sure. Right. Uh, is there a theory of parental alienation? Can either parent alienate the child? Could a reunification camp uh, alienate a child? All those things are considerations that are taken into account by child custody experts. Right. If I could but, just but we are um, we are focusing in particular on the issue of parental alienation syndrome. Period. We're just asking for an explanation. There's no right or wrong answer to that question, but we want, do want to have that then reviewed by a board member, a former board member, and if they feel appropriate to have that reviewed by a child custody expert so that we can make sure that we are not bringing somebody in as a child custody uh, subject matter expert who might have an ax to grind one way or the other as to the outcomes of particular cases. That's, that's all we're trying to do. Well, just to your point about, I, I wasn't implying that this was a worry from the perspective of who was going to serve as an expert. I think it also is of great concern to people who have committed their entire careers working in this area. And that there's concern that, and I'm, I'm very glad to hear you say what you said, there was a real desire to have people serving as experts who have a broad knowledge of this area and who understand the distinction, for example, between PAS and parental alienation, so that if a, if a complaint is filed against a person who works in this area, and we all know it's a very high-risk area to work in, that there is some comfort level that the people who are serving as experts, who might be reviewing those, would have an understanding um, that just because, that, for example, if a psychologist works in this area and um, works from the perspective that there are, as you said, many reasons why a child may resist, refuse being with a parent, that 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 is that this screening would not somehow screen out too broadly, and and that's that's the point that we want to be sure and make here. And, and we have no desire to do that either. Okay. And the people that we do choose to be child custody experts are highly experienced in the area of child custody and are very up to date on their continuing education. We require them to show us that their continuing education is up to date. Um, we actually consulted with a very highly regarded child custody expert who sometimes asks, acts as a subject matter expert, so I will not identify that person. but. Um, who was very conversant in this and was very nuanced in his discussion with the enforcement committee of how we should approach this. He had very much the same reaction. A lot of people have parental mm -hmm. alienation. What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And that's why we narrowed it down very specifically to, to parental alienation syndrome because we felt that was an issue on which the thinking is largely in psychology very, uh, seems to be very developed in one particular direction as opposed to another. I think we can all agree on that. Um, so. We're being, we're being very careful to be respectful of 
people that work in this area, but we want to also make sure that we're doing the best job possible in screening our subject matter experts, not screening all child custody experts, but our subject matter experts to make sure that they're not taking a particular point of view with which the board has determined that it's uncomfortable. Okay. And just, and just before, I mean, I know you want to say, I just want to go back to the notion of the stakeholder meeting and, and just, I think, um, unfortunately, maybe the impression was left that it was not a real, a, a full-blown stakeholder meeting. And again, if, if we did something to indicate that we shouldn't get an invitation, then that was our mistake. Um, but I would just urge us all to kind of remember that these um, meetings that maybe turn out to be something different, and, and maybe that's why I'm saying maybe we should always be a stakeholder, because you never know how the meeting is going to turn out. Um, maybe that's what happened here. In the end, there were recommendations that really do have uh, possible serious implications for practicing psychologists. We are always delighted to have the California Psychological Association at any of our stakeholder Good. meetings that aren't so specific, like website consumers or something like that. I don't know that we'd necessarily include you in that particular right. one. But, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I do think that there was an informal uh, invitation extended as far as I knew, but you explained how you didn't know that the scope right. of the right. meeting would be that far-ranging. Right. The meeting was very far-ranging because there were representatives of the Judicial Council and any number of organizations there. Uh, two boards were represented. Um, so it was a, it was, it was a, there were a hell of a lot of people at that meeting. I, I saw. And we're sorry in retrospect <laughs> that you weren't there. Yeah, we are too. Yeah. All the, they were all governmental organizations, I, however, because we were trying not, to be. Not everyone there was a governmental organization. The judicial, the oh, judicial, CJE was oh, Council there. on oh. Judicial Excellence. Well, yeah, they were announced as. But, and there was also a child custody expert there at that meeting, wasn't there? Or no? No. no. I didn't okay. see anybody. I mean, um, I know that you were there and. and um, as far as mandating child abuse and domestic violence education, independent of what the Judicial Council does or doesn't do, we want to make sure our experts have this. I don't think this is a necessarily a severe burden for child custody experts that normally work in the court system if they do. Uh, maybe private child custody experts don't go through this training, but we want to make sure for our subject matter experts, not for everybody, but just for our subject matter experts, okay. that they've got, uh, that we're guaranteed of a sufficient background in this area, regardless of what they're demonstrating to the Judicial Council. So okay. that's really kind of, you may think that's, uh, what do they call it? I just wanted to make yeah. sure that, um, well, it may be redundant. Yeah, we were, we were I aware mean, of that. But, but, but we just wanted to make sure that the board understood that there was a requirement always in place. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, else? I had a couple of other comments. So, Dr. Phillips, first of all, I wanted to thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your explanation that it would not just be staff, that it would really be experts that would be reviewing these answers. However, I have to say I s still want to reiterate some of the concerns or maybe put a different, um, raise different aspects of it. One, in terms of the stakeholder meeting, it's not just us as CPA, um, but for example, the AFCC, we've heard from members of the AFCC, they are, the ex they are an expert organization in terms of dealing with high conflict families and the courts and, and um, uh, custody evaluators. So uh, I've always appreciated that the board really, when they get public comment or when they have uh, uh, stakeholder meetings, that really people are broadly included and that all perspectives that are relevant are taken into consideration. And obviously, sometimes things happen and they weren't done, and some things were missed. And I've appreciated that the board in the past has been willing to go back and look at things, particularly these haven't actually been implemented yet. So that that's one thing that I, I really do feel that it's important to get to get the other people, other organizations, not just uh, CPA, but other mm -hmm. groups who feel that they are a stakeholder in this issue as well to be able to give some comment. And the other thing is, in terms of the screening for the parental alienation syndrome, as Dr. Lindergrove mentioned, I am not an expert in this area, but I don't know, I haven't heard of anyone who is actually a proponent of parental alienation syndrome. Maybe that exists. There are some. Uh, okay. There are some. 
Okay, good. So um, <laughs> then, but then you know who they are. So one, the other point that I wanted to mention, it was raised by one of our expert, uh, uh, child custody um, expert, is usually people are judged on what are their behaviors, not like what are their feelings or their thoughts. And I expect that already you have a screening in place for who's going to be a, a subject matter expert. And I guess I'm also wondering if somebody is out there and has published in an extreme view in one way or another or has is known professionally and publicly to have an extreme view, would that not already be somebody that would be screened out in your normal processes? And, and that's another question that I just have about the implementation of this special screening as opposed to whatever's already, or in addition to, or opposed to, um, whatever screening is already in place for subject matter experts, and wouldn't that be sufficient? And it, it, Well, and I think the other thing was someone also asked us, well, are they going to screen on the other end? So if you screen to exclude um, anyone who adheres to the, the uh, concept of parental alienation syndrome, are you going to also screen out anyone who doesn't think that there's such a thing as parental alienation. Well, that yes. will be highlighted by the question and the answer to the question, I think. Well, um, well, but if you're only asking about parental alienation syndrome, that's why the language is so important. And Do that, you know of any psychologists that are, are proponents that there's no such thing as parental alienation? Uh, psychologists? No. I, well, I don't. But I'm not... I, I don't either. Uh, you know, I don't. I think what our what we have been left with is a, a very serious understanding of the complexity of this area and the nuances and the the, um, the the need for being very aware, which you have indicated that you are. And so I appreciate that. Uh, we felt it was really our obligation to bring this forward to the board and comment before these things are implemented in kind of a sort of a quick and easy way um, that it's perhaps not as quick and easy as it might have seemed at the beginning. So I don't know if this is accurate, but I, I'd just like to respond to you all a little bit, and this might be a little bit larger issue for another <laughs> meeting, but um, I, I know, let me think, get my get my thoughts together. Okay, so you heard what Dr. Phillips said mm -hmm. about how this is going to be addressed, you know. I think, I don't know if it's in the communication, and that could definitely be it. I mean, this, like you brought up something earlier, Dr. Winkleman, not about this issue, but another issue that it was probably in the communication that, th you know, things blew up. Um, but I, I think we need to have some way of um, being, at least being able to reassure people that we understand that these, the board understands these are c complex issues. And it's not black and white. And, um, you know, so like we just change this to syndrome versus parental alienation because those are different things. Um, and I want to be uh, respectful of the concerns of your members, because I, of which I am one. <laughs> uh, because I do think most psychologists really want to do a good job. Um, so I don't know if it's in the communication or what, but I'm hoping that y'all are reassured by what Dr. Phillips had to say and about how this will proceed and how each case is, each person who wants to be an expert in this area, and by the way, just to answer your question, Dr. Winkleman, I think one of the things we want to do probably in all the areas is ensure that our experts, because it's a general, do you qualify as an expert, kind of tell us what your specialty areas are. So as we learn more about areas where there might be m more potential problems, we want to go more in depth. And I think that's what this effort is, because it's a very, 
I'm going to say a very general, um, I mean, there are criteria, but people identify their own areas of expertise mm -hmm. to the board or, you know, to people who are looking them up. So we go on that. We don't know everybody, for example, who writes on parental alienation syndrome, but if some person were to say, yeah, you know, well, I do this, I believe in it, I've written books on it or whatever, of course we're going to. I really appreciate that. And I noticed in one of the responses on the Sunset Review that um, you said your number of, your total number of expert reviewers had dropped by more than half mm -hmm. since the last Sunset Review. And you specifically noted that it is difficult to find content experts mm -hmm. in child custody, neuropsychology, forensic psychology. So I recognize that as a problem. And we, we do really try, and we're going to try even uh, harder, to um, communicate to our members and your licensees the, the seriousness with which the board takes these issues. We know, for example, today that there are people watching this webcast um, for this item. And we encourage that because we, we want our uh, our members and others who work in this area, in any area where there is this kind of um, uh, complexity, to understand how the board works. And so uh, I appreciate that, and, and we, we take that. We're, um, you know, it's hard to communicate um, in, a, in a short, summary everything that goes on at a board of psychology meeting um but we are gonna we're gonna give we're gonna give that a shot and um i do communicate to our board uh the highlights of the meeting but we're gonna think about doing that more broadly and we and we want to encourage uh people to to be interested in the processes of the board and I absolutely think that's important. And so, again, uh, appreciate the time. Uh, we don't want to take any more time and appreciate the time and particularly the clarification on some of these issues, which is exactly why we wanted to bring it forward to the board. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Is there any more public comment? Seeing none. Uh, could, and having had board discussion already, unless anybody has any further comments to make on the subject, um, could you call the roll? Kasuga. Turn. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Aye. Harpsheets. Aye. Horn. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Aye. Tate. Aye. We are now going to take a seven-minute restroom break. <laughs>
we'd vote on that and then the second office. So uh, does the board wish to take the office of president first? Yes. Okay. So what I would do then is open it up and allow nominations to be made for the office of president. And the way we would work it is if there are multiple nominations, then as we would go around, each board member would vote for the um, their uh, selection for who's from who's been nominated. Did I miss anything? I don't believe so. So the f I will no I will nominate Sayron Fu for the office of president of the board. Are there any other nominations for the office of president? I nominate Jacqueline Horn. I'm going to withdraw my name. Thank you, though. <laughs> Uh, can I nominate Dr. Phillips? My day is done. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for thinking of me. I appreciate it. Can I nominate um, <laughs> Dr. Harp Sheets? For president? Yes. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then um, I would think the best way to go about it is to call the roll and uh, each member will vote uh, yes or no for uh, Mr. Fu as president of the board. Oh, she got it. <laughs> I don't know why I thought she was calling the thing. Sorry. Okay. Kasuga. Yes. Cervantes. No hard feelings. <laughs> yes. Cervantes. Oh, you were saying yes to you. Yes. Gotcha. Foo. Hi. Harp sheets. Yes. Horn. Yes. Phillips. Hi. Tate. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. okay. So the next office is for the vice president. And so again, we can take nominations for the role of vice president for the board. I would like to nominate Dr. Cheryl Kasuga. And I would like to nominate Dr. Mary Harb Sheets. Are there any other nominations? Okay, we'll close the nominations then, and again, we'll take roll, and as your name is called, please indicate whether you would be voting for Dr. Cheryl Kasuga or Dr. Mary Harpsheets for vice president. Kasuga. Harpsheets. Cervantes. Harpsheets. Fu. Kasuga. Harpsheets. Harp sheets. Horn. Kasuga. Phillips. Harp sheets. Tate. Harp sheets. Harp sheets with five to two. Okay. We did not include this as part of the nomination, so I ask for a separate motion for the term of office to be for the calendar year beginning uh, January 1st, 2020. So moved. Second. Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. 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 Horn. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Tate. Aye. Motion passes.
Wow, that went incredibly smoothly. I would like to thank the board. <laughs> Some of our past elections have been less than smooth. I think even those out there in the, in the public gallery would agree with me on that score. Um, <laughs> Some of them took weeks to, re to recover from. <laughs> <laughs> so we are now going to go to the licensure committee report. Dr. Phillips. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I am very, very sorry. I realized that before we call for the vote, public I comment. forgot to ask for public comment. So let's see if there's any public comment and see if there is any need to redo the votes, nominations so and votes. So you public comment on the... On the elections, yes. Okay. Is there any public comment on the election? <laughs> Or on the motion for the term of office. Is there any public comment on the motion as to term of office? It was a thriller. <laughs> okay, now I see none. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Are, is that sufficient to our purposes, or do you need us to vote all over again? No, I just wanted to see if there's any public comment. To, to, and if there were, then we might have needed to vote again, but there is not, so I don't think we need to vote again. Okay, great. Okay, so as I was saying, we're going to move on to item number 28, the licensure committee report. Uh, Dr. Horn was kind enough to take care of one action item off this report uh, earlier on, 28D was, I don't know, whatever it was. Um, so I will turn it over to Dr. Horn. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, if we're going to take action items. Um, only in the licensure committee report. So if you'll look at 28B, which is page 596 of the combined agenda book, um, this uh, came to us because there we wanted a policy for how to go about uh, I don't know, settling any controversy but when a verification of experience forms don't match the hours between the supervisee and the supervisor don't match. We asked staff to um, look into this and make some recommendations and their three recommendations were um, on page 597 and um, the licensure committee voted um, to recommend to the board that um, the option number three. That is, uh, these cases would be presented to the licensure committee for review and consideration on a case-by-case -case basis in closed session. That's our recommendation. So I'd like to ask the board to Mr. Fu. So, um, so moved that we adopt option three for the committee to conduct case-by-case -case review to resolve discrepancies identifi identified between weekly logs and verification of experience. Second. <clears throat> so is there any board discussion about this? Any discussion from the public about this? Seeing none, let's call for the vote here. Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next item, action item is 28C. Page 598, revisions to uh, the guidelines for review of requests for extension. For extension, so if y'all will remember, um, a couple of years ago, I guess we created a um, uh, a I don't know a table or guides for staff uh, for when they could make a decision um, if somebody was requesting uh, an extension of, say, the 72-month uh, limitation for a psychological assistant registration or the 30-month limit, consecutive limit to accrue 
um, 1,500 hours of SPE. Is it 1,500 or 3,000? Uh, it could be uh, either. It depends uh, what kind of extension request that uh, the uh, applicant or okay. registration is requesting. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And thanks for sitting up here. We may ask you some <laughs> questions. So. Um, and uh, anything that didn't fall within those parameters, then the staff brought back to the licensure committee for discussion, and those are some of the things that we've been presenting here to the board for uh, your um, approval. But um, the um, what we wanted to do, um, because we were getting some requests for extension that uh, I, I want to say pretty routinely, um, that we thought if if we had good guidelines for it, the staff could uh, uh, follow through on those as well. And um, the particular, and what we wanted to do was submit to um, let people who were requesting extension know our general guidelines too. Um, so that they know what to say to us when they're applying. So um, we have, um, staff came up with this, um, these guidelines for uh, people who are submitting requests for extension because what was happening all, uh, sometimes is they would ask for something, then the staff would tell them, this is, these are, the conditions under which you can so apply or this will have to go to the board and so again it was also to help or to the licensure committee so it's to help speed that process along as well um, so we do have now these guidelines um, for um, these additional guidelines for staff but also to let requesters know, our licensees or our potential licensees know. That's what we're asking for your approval on. So. Um, move to adopt the revised uh, guidelines as written. I second. So it's been moved and second. Is there any board uh, to adopt the guidelines as written, these are as revised? Um, is there any board discussion, more board discussion about this, or any board discussion about this? Is there any public discussion about this? Oh, you have some discussion? Um, I just wanted to say that I think it's a good idea, and I'm glad that this was, was Great. taken on. Great. Great. Which last sentence? Microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, on uh, page 600 of the combined packet, the last sentence reads, an extension to registration beyond the 72-month limitation is unnecessary if the individual has successfully re accrued all rewire required experience. And I think that has come up. That's come up. Right? And, and it's really to have time to take the test and... Um, I'd like that that clarifies because I think that would be very useful. Mm -hmm. So did, did that make sense to folks what Dr. Harpsheets was saying? Yeah. Once the, once the, well, it, it made sense so I don't need to. <laughs> 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 There's no public discussion. So uh, could we call for the vote? Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Horn. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Tate. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, so the next one we've already taken, that's 28D, and y'all approved that for the licensure committee to 
make these decisions and um, and, um, and the staff is going to write the change or that goes in our sunset review that's the request in our sunset review right so the request is in our sunset review and the hope is that the joint committees of the business and professions committees will um, take that into consideration and put that in our sunset extension legislation okay um, if it does not get accepted then we will seek an author to add that into our statute okay thanks all right so since I guess we just voted on that this uh, meeting, we need to go through these requests. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it'll be the final time. Wow. Probably not. So, <laughs> so, oh, that's true. That was so sad. <laughs> so, this will be. Um, Psych applicant number one, psychologist applicant number one, this person wants a request. They're requesting an eight-month extension to their 30-consecutive-month uh, limitation to accrue postdoc supervised experience. And what you can see here is that um, the person, uh, number one, reported a total of a little over 3,000 hours, but because of the timing uh, the of, uh, what do I want to say, the dates of when the hours were accrued, um, none of the earlier hours were counted and the later hours didn't fall within the, um, isn't that correct, the later hours didn't fall within the 30 uh, month time limit um, and this person had um, a number of difficulties getting that um, uh, this person moved to uh, California to a small town it was and had already begun accruing uh, postdoc hours it took a while to find a, uh, an appropriate supervisor given the area that uh, this person was working. Uh, finally, the person did find a local supervisor, and um, but that relationship ended when the supervisor retired in May of this year, and um, so um, this person is number one is requesting an eight-month extension that would allow the extra supervision hours that he or she's already accrued to be counted in the total number. And we granted that, or we're recommending that the board grant that extension. So, so moved. <laughs> Second. All right. <laughs> so it's been moved and seconded that we uh, grant that extension to number one. Any more board discussion about that? Any discussion from the public? Seeing none, I'd like to call the vote, please. Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. All right, thank you. Okay, the next action item is 28E. It's applicant number two. And applicant number two requested a three year and four month extension to the 30 consecutive months uh, to accrue. Uh, pre-doctoral supervised experience. Um, and you can see here the breakdown of the um, experience when um, applicant number two had accrued these hours. Now, 
um, the reason why applicant number two had such a long time in between uh, beginning the accrual of hours and then when all the hours were finally accrued was that um, that person got terminated from their first internship and then was required by the doctoral program to stay out a year and not apply, uh, wasn't given permission by, by the doctoral program to apply and for a whole year. So that put the person uh, essentially two years behind after uh, being, you know, essentially ready to go on internship. Um, but the person has now... Um, can, I, can I interrupt for a second, Dr. Mm -hmm. Horn? I also think part of the chronology, if I understand correctly, is that they were then asked to go back and do practicum placements before right, they could go correct. into an internship. Before they could go into So they were really put through the ringer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, delayed number two's um, movement forward for several years as a result. Now... Um, the internship, the subsequent internship has been completed, um, and this uh, number two is hoping that we will app approve sort of in retrospect because this person went way longer than the 30 months. Our recommendation is that we do approve the already accrued hours for pre dot supervised experience. So, like, so moved. Second. Does anybody um, on the any further? So they still need to do their doctoral experience. Postdoc. Postdoc mm -hmm. experience, right? Correct. Um, I also want to say, just it's encouraging to see programs um, be active gatekeepers relative to who right. gets into the profession. I would rather see a remediation. I don't know the particulars of this case, the equities of it, but mm -hmm. I'd rather see somebody remediate than just kind of get passed through. Um, as some programs do. Absolutely, I like to. I totally agree with you. So, um, any other board discussion about this? Any public discussion? All right, seeing none, call. To, uh, I'd like to call for the vote, please. Kasuga, aye. Cervantes, aye. Aye. Harbsheets, aye. Horn, aye. So, when my thing keeps going off, minus two. Is it because there's too many turned on? So uh, there's only five, so I'm trying to turn mine off after I call your name. So if you can not press the button ahead of time, that'll work out. I think that both of you. <laughs> Are we done all this? No, not yet. Okay, it's okay. I think I was at Harp Sheets. Harp Sheets? Oh, aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Aye. Motion passes. All right, moving on to 28E. Applicant. Who else has their microphone on? Okay. Number three is requesting a one-year extension to the 30-month uh, limitation to accrue uh, postdoc SPE. And um, the, um, the issue here is that this person completed 630 hours and has completed all the hours, but completed 630 of those hours after the 30-month period um, due to having had to take time off during the postdoc experience for um, mental health reasons. And so then the person came back and completed their hours. So the uh, licensure committee is recommending that we grant that one year extension request the person's already gained the hours but 
we want to be able to capture the hours that person so moved. gained. Second. So it's been moved and seconded that we um, accept the committee's recommendation to grant the one-year extension. Any more board conversation? Quick question. So you were satisfied with the documentation you received? We were. Was consonant with a mental we health, were. serious mental health? Yes, okay, serious great. mental health Thanks. problem. Yeah. Any other board discussion about this? Um, any public discussion about this? All right, seeing none, call for the vote, please. Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Your microphone's not on, No, hers, stealth is, too. hers is stealth. It's oh, now stealth mode as well. <laughs> it used to light up. Oh. It's very sad. Who? Aye. Harb sheets? <laughs> Aye. Horn? Aye. Tate? Aye. Phillips. No way. Yeah. Sorry. Was, I'm sorry. Forgotten already. <laughs> <laughs> it's Hi. a very precipitous <laughs> decline. <laughs> <laughs> My cursor went too fast. I skipped right over. <laughs> Still love you, though. All right. We have one more, I think. And this is 28F. And this is a psych assistant. Uh, request for extension of the 72 month uh, registration to be a psych assistant. This person is requesting a one year extension of the 72 month registration period as a psych assistant. Um, this uh, person is ex the psych assistant extension is set to expire, I mean the psych assistant 72 month period is set to expire on October 23rd of uh, this year, just this month. Um, um, but um, this person has already accrued all the hours necessary for uh, licensure as a psychologist. Um, the person is requesting uh, uh, the extension to have, um, well, has previously requested an extension that was denied um, because that person needed extra time to study for the EPPP. This is just a training category. Once the hours are accrued, um, then the expectation is that the person moves on toward licensure. As you can see, this person has taken the EPPP a number of times um, and hasn't um, passed it. So um, doesn't mean this person can't take it again. Uh, take the exam again. But in this category, again, which is a training category to get the uh, necessary hours for pre and postdoc, uh, pre or and slash or postdoc uh, supervised experience, and the person has already gotten those, uh, the committee is requesting or recommending that we deny that person's request for a one-year extension. So, so moved. Second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that we deny number, well, it's a different category, so psych assistant number one's um, request for a one year extension. And um, I'm, uh, is there any other board discussion about this? I think it was important the, the person. So we submitted this because of an increase in mental health symptoms, right. and so the you know the question is well when they took did that one year were they going to continue to see people, at the same time they had this increase in mental health symptoms, so I think that was something we had talked about right. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Actually, one of the things we did was check to see if this person. Um, had 
uh, because this person has ADHD, if this person might have requested additional time and all like that. So there are to take the EPPP. Um, so I think we're making that that person can do that. So uh, we and we didn't feel like these the materials we got didn't preclude this person from taking the EPPP. Um, and, and again, I'm going to say this is a training category. That's, that's how we've conceived it, and this person is definitely over that training period and has, um, and has been for quite a while. So, um, And we've seen lots of examples of people that have tried to extend their time because they wanted to make it into a terminal right. licensing category. It's, right. it's, it's a pass-through, not a destination. Right. So I think consistent with that philosophy, I think it's appropriate. I think the committee's recommendation is appropriate. And our new guidelines will be saying that, so our revised guidelines, so just so that people are clear about that. So. Any uh, public discussion about this? All righty. Seeing none, let's call for the vote. We do have a motion, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Seconded by Dr. Kasuga. All right. Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Fu. Aye. Harb Sheets. Aye. Horn. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Tate. Aye. The motion passes. Okay, we have another action item for the uh, <laughs> licensure committee. This is 28G, and this is a, a, starts on page uh, 614 of the combined packet. Now, this was, uh, if you will recall, we um, at our last at our last board meeting, the um, concern was brought up that. Well, let me back up. In our stakeholder meeting, if you'll remember, when we were looking at pathways to licensure, one of the things that was recommended by the stakeholders meeting is that we change the psych assistant title to psychological associate. And uh, the um, and that's what we put forward, and that's what we were going to do. Then. Um, we got the information that there are some jurisdictions, some states that use that term psychological associate. It's a licensure category, not a training category like it is for us. And um, so there was concern that this might be confusing to people who may be coming from somewhere else or going somewhere else and all this kind of stuff. And so what we did was we, um, and I'd like to thank Mr. Thomas for sending this out, and he got just a really quick uh, response uh, from a lot of jurisdictions, you know, about what are the terms you use, et cetera. So if you can see uh, the title of training categories that other jurisdictions use, they run the gamut, but... Um, 11 jurisdictions use the title psychological assistant, 13 use the title psychological associate, and there are a bunch of other titles. So the licensure committee thought that um, since this was a uh, recommendation from the stakeholders meeting and there were a number of reasons for that term, uh, using that term rather than psychological assistant, uh, and seeing that uh, there are plenty of other terms that are used, and if we're going to go just by these two, more jurisdictions use psychological associate than do psychological assistant. So our recommendation is to stay with the psychological associate as in our pathways to licensure as uh, originally recommended. That's our recommendation to the board. So... So moved. <laughs> second. I'm not going to be able to do that. I second. So it's been moved and seconded that we stick with psychological associate as a, that term instead of psychological assistant. Any board discussion? 
about this? Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> um, I still think that there's a possibility we're creating confusion. Since psychological associate in some jurisdictions, as I understand it from Mr. Thomas's research in our prior discussion, it is a terminal degree, or it's a terminal licensing category for master's level clinicians. So um, my preference would be, because I do think we're creating some confusion, is that we do something that indicates that this is not a licensed position, this is a registered position. So my only suggestion is, and then I will bite the bullet and whatever happens, happens, um, is that we call it a registered psychological associate uh, so that we make it clear that it's not a licensing category, it's a registration category. Um, They're called a registered psychological assistant now, right? And they could be called a registered psychological mm -hmm. associate. Mm -hmm. So that's my only suggestion. I think that would kind of, in my mind, ameliorate some of the confusion and make it clear exactly what's going on and people can still call themselves a psychological associate. And so that's my two cents. Happy to make that amendment if it's the will of the body and the chair. The yeah, I guess I wasn't even thinking to, that that was going to change at all, that the only thing that was going to change was assistant to associate. So, so if, that, I, so if it's understand. clear that they're registered, I'm good. Okay. Happy to second it. Okay, any other discussion about the this issue? Asso uh, keeping registered psychological associate. Um, any public discussion about this? All righty, seeing none. <laughs> Let's call for the vote. Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. Fu. Aye. Harbsheets. Aye. Horn. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Tate. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now I know this one is for informational purposes only, but I want to talk about it anyway if it's. Okay, all right, thank you. And this is 28 I, is it? H person. H, sorry. Um, let me get back to it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so I, I kind of want to put these together. <laughs> huh? Yeah. The next few, because they're all around the same issue, and I do want to talk about it because we had got, we had gotten input. The board asked us to get input. We got input to the licensure committee, and this has gone over a few times. So I do want to update everybody, and let you know where we are, what we're recommending. So you will recall that we um, asked. There's a license in um, the. Th through the Board of Behavioral Sciences that's called uh, Licensed Educational Psychologist. That includes school psychologists primarily. I'd say all the school psychologists are in that licensure category, and I'm, I'm not sure what, other, what the other training was, but I think it was just school psychologists. Um, and they become licensed educational psychologists if they are going to work outside the school system. Otherwise, in the school system, they're called school psychologists. But if they're working outside, and there was a lot of concern. Um, there's public confusion about whether they're psychologists or not. Um, and there's also, there was some concern, particularly, I'd say, uh, with um, psychologists or people who work with um, folks who are some carry the diagnosis of autism or somewhere on the autism spectrum, the kinds of evaluations that are being done by um, this group of licensees that may not really be the best evaluation in terms of um, really coming up with good, and you can help me on this, Ms. Kasuga, but, I mean, Dr. Kasuga, but um, that 
they might not have the qualifications to do an assessment for autism and recommend the be best treatment method. So that was that community had raised these uh, issues in particular. So we had this group come talk to the licensure committee, and we had the chair of that group the, uh, talk to us, who, um, and we talked about maybe clarifying uh, the differences, some way of clarifying the differences, and maybe that would be something that their association could put out, clarifying the differences and all this kind of stuff. What ended up happening was that the determination was made that they thought it was clear enough that all the evaluations they were doing were connected to education and how somebody would fare in the educational system, and they were all centered around that. And that if they were doing something else, that would be outside their scope of practice. So um, then we had, so that was from, I'm trying to think who gave that. That was the Board of Behavioral Sciences. Mm -hmm. Then we had somebody from the uh, Pupil Personnel Services to talk to us about their credential uh, because they have a school psychology credential and we uh, asked them to present that to us. And actually what was very helpful, we had a school psychologist who was also a licensed educational psychologist from the Elk Grove School District, which is close to Sacramento for folks who don't know, come and talk to us about what he does as a school psychologist. So it's, it wasn't within the school system that we had the difficulty, I think, that the concern was. It was things that were happening outside the school system. So we got, we got feedback from them about what, how a school psychologist is using the school system, that was fine. But again, the larger issue is what, what about folks who are licensed educational psychologists who are practicing outside the school system and uh, who may not have the training to do some of the uh, uh, kind of assessments they're doing and make the uh, kinds of recommendations they're making and what to do about it. So the, um, the licensure committee um, asked our staff to work with the Board of Behavioral Sciences to produce a document or some kind of educational materials, right? Is that what we're recommending? Um, on page 646 of the combined mm -hmm. document, um, the memo has an action yeah. uh, requested. Yeah. If you want to. There we go. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, needless to say, the licensure committee was still concerned about what had been. Um, presented to us, what had been discussed, and what actions had been taken. So we are making the recommendation that our licensure committee and our staff work with the Board of Behavioral Sciences, the T uh, Commission on Teachers Credentialing, and our board to co-host a stakeholders meeting in the probably next year to get input on how we can best inform consumers about the respective roles of these three professions or these three groups and the differences between them and what they are trained to do and what they're not trained to do and all like that. So that's what we're recommending. So Stakeholders moved. meeting. I'm sorry. So moved. <laughs> okay. Second. So it's been moved and seconded to um, put together or co-host a stakeholders meeting with these other two groups, Board of Behavioral Sciences and the Commission on Teachers Credentialing. 
about the um, get input about how to best inform consumers on the differences between these three groups, what their training is, what they're qualified to do, and all that kind of stuff. So, any board discussion about that? Um, I have a, a question. Um, on, this, on this topic, in K-12 education, there's a lot of stakeholders. And so with the suggestion of a stakeholder meeting, I guess I just want to um, make sure that we have the stakeholders that are, that are appropriate. And I think there's, and it's just a larger community than probably here in psychology. Yeah. And probably even that just uh, BBS deals with. I just. So I, I think what, what probably our staff will do is if we work with these other mm -hmm. uh, groups and get their recommendations too they may have a different they may have different stakeholder lists than we do um, i was just going to add that um, one of the things that we mentioned at the committee meeting was that we would be looking to department of ed and board of behavioral sciences to identify their stakeholders um, to reach out to them, and we would reach out to our own stakeholders so that the three organizations, um, and Commission on Teacher Credentialing is under Department mm -hmm. of Ed, so mm -hmm. that we would all work to reach out to our respective stakeholders. I don't think it's our place to identify who mm -hmm. Department of Ed stakeholders would be, so mm -hmm. we would rely on them and their expertise to identify that to get productive uh, participants and and I would just say that we would California Psychological Association has identified themselves as interested parties in this and we would hope that um, in this stakeholder meeting that they would reach out to their respective membership divisions that would be particularly interested in this topic area and and get that invite uh, word out I also recommend um, like maybe uh, the Association of Regional Center ARCA to be one of the stakeholders mm -hmm. for um, this this meeting mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are um, like what we're talking mm -hmm. about the ones that um, kind of like interact with the mm -hmm. the consumers that are outside of um, the school setting so they're the ones that have a similar do similar assessments mm -hmm. as like a licensed educational psychologist but you know they're the ones that are part of our jurisdiction. It's a great idea. And assumedly, the the uh, Department of Education would include some kind of association that represents non-public schools, because they also use these services a lot. Mm -hmm. And psychologists, I mean, all three categories actually. So I think they're a logical person. But maybe we can leave that up to the Department of Ed. Uh, but keep an eye out for that to see that they're included. Um, I have a question with regards to scope. I know that part of it is um, um, informing consumers regarding the respective roles, um, and I just wanted uh, the the respective roles is a little broad. And one of the things that I want to be that I want included is the uh, referral, making prop proper referral, because that's that I think is um, not just clarifying which one, um, what each uh, license licensee does and differentiating each, you know, mm -hmm. each role, but also um, making sure for consumer protection that there's um, proper referrals that are made. Yeah. Because I, um, just from the, the report um, from what happened during the licensing committee meeting, it seems like um, the Board of Behavioral Sciences, when they, um, came and re made a report, and um, it seems like they, in their opinion, that there are no um, no concerns from the public. But I feel like it's up to the public to say if they have concerns. If they're confused, it's like um, they're the ones that are going to say what's the confusion, where the confusion is coming from, where the potential harm and the actual harm is coming mm -hmm. from. And I think that part of it is like um, has something to do with proper referrals. Well, I think what happens, and maybe you've already said this, is that 
they, they are authorized to provide some level of counseling specifically around these educational needs. But imagine a private practice person who's sitting out there and they've got this family and they're working with them. And then that then begins to cross in, beyond that limitation. And I think that's where we expressed a lot of concern. Mm -hmm. And you're right that the, the VBS people didn't really think that was a problem. I'm not sure how they really knew that, but that um, that was a big worry, kind of what you're saying, Dr. Kasuga, too. Well, I th one of the things just, uh, I, just from this last meeting, I think, to point out is that um, Ms. Madsen from the Board of Behavioral Sciences made it very clear that this was a stakeholder meeting for, um, you know, the, to inform consumers regarding the respective roles, but it was not to reopen the practice acts uh, at all. And so I think how we talk about the referrals in a way that respects everyone's profession and doesn't accidentally trigger a conversation about reopening the the Practice Act leading key folks to walk away from that conversation, I think, would be really important um, for that. And, and I think, um, Dr. Harpsheets, I think one of the questions we did ask at the licensure committee was um, if if the board had received complaints about um, <coughs> the a, a um, license or LEP um, acting inappropriately and acted their scope, and the response was that it was from from BBS was that that wasn't the case. So I think that's that was it well, was offered of, at, at as a question in response to a question. Well, I should it say. sounds. Oh, sorry. Partly that relies, and I think this is what you were getting yeah. to, to, Dr. Kasuga. It relies on the consumer knowing or the public knowing yeah. what's yes. appropriate and what's not. You know, mm -hmm. are they being referred appropriately, et cetera, et cetera, and the. People don't know this, right, you yeah. know, and, and so that's what we're trying to do, keep that from having to be on the consumer um, to well, know what's a, I mean, when, when this is appropriate and when this isn't. But I think that would f absolutely fit in with what we're trying to do, what we want to do and, and clarify. Those of us who work in the field, too, know that consumers are reluctant, mm -hmm. you know, even if as a psychologist, the psychologist says, um, you know, you've just brought up something of, of which I really don't have the expertise mm -hmm. to treat you, and we want to, say, refer them. Um, they're very reluctant mm -hmm. to go and tell their story over again. So I could see where the overlap mm -hmm. would happen. Right. But, Dr. Fu, I think Mr. what we... <laughs> Oh, Mr. Fu, sorry. Thank you, though. I take the but you'll take it, right? <laughs> um, but I think, <laughs> yeah, we um, though I have talked about it from an informational perspective, mm -hmm. so it wasn't adversarial. Mm -hmm. That that was the direction, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think I think to reinforce what Dr. Horn was saying, sometimes consumers don't know what they don't know, right. mm -hmm. so they don't know what the distinctions are. So they may treat these categories interchangeably in the same way. Sometimes as a psychologist someone will start to see us and then ask us for medication right. mm -hmm. and obviously we don't prescribe medication so i think it's it's in everybody's best interest if we make it clear where these demarcations are mm -hmm. obviously there's some areas where there might be overlap of some sort um, i think for some professionals i'm not talking about any of the boards or any licensing category per se the ambiguity of the situation they use to their benefit, and I don't think that's in the best interest of the consumers. I just have one more comment with regards to consumers and informing on this particular topic. Um, when we get to the point of creating a collateral piece or how we distribute information, I think on this particular topic, there really needs to be a sensitivity towards language and culture um, in different uh, regions of the state. Um, there, um, there's, um, well, we, we know our state is very diverse, and I just wanted to point that out. Ms. Torek, with, with our other brochure that we worked with BBS, uh, Osteopathic Medicine, and uh, the Medical Board, am I missing? It, what, that, was, um, that was the therapy, do, never includes sex. Was that translated into other languages mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. Into Spanish. To, into Spanish, okay. So, and I think there was opportunities, if folks did have questions, to contact directly to receive other versions of it. 
Um, DCA has Google Translate on um, their server, so if someone wanted it in another language, they could use Google Translate, which isn't 100% reliable, but it does give other opportunities for other languages. Um, but because the most requested is a Spanish version, mm -hmm. that's why the four boards decided to go with that as the translation. So not to commit us to anything, but it sounds like it's likely that we would probably do this in at least Spanish and then offer and also allow in such a readable way for Google Translate to provide access mm -hmm. for others. Right. Okay. Any more board discussion about this? Is there any public comment about this? Seeing none, I think we call for the vote. Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbsheets? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Tate? Is absent. Gotcha. <laughs> reading raffle is. Done. <laughs> that concludes the licensure committee report. Uh, was everything? Some of it was non action. Then I would say go ahead and just uh, do a motion generally to cover those individual items that you did not vote on for the remainder of the report. To just accept the Correct. remainder of the report? Correct. Correct. <laughs> You're the motion guy. At the, at the cajoling and behest. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, to. <laughs> Move to adopt the licensure committee report for items not uh, covering um, action items. Thank you. S a second. Second. <laughs> I was thinking thank you. Second. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded to accept the remainder of the licensure committee report, those non-action items. Um, is there any board discussion about this? Is there any public discussion about this? Okay, seeing none. Can we call for the vote, please? Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Fu? Aye. Harbshoots? Aye. Horn? Aye. Phillips? Phillips? Aye. Motion passes. Do we need to do that for the ledge report then too? Cause no. Oh. Right. No, I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm good. I, I want you I'm to be deprived of emotion. I don't, I'm not at all. I, I don't feel neglected, so I'm good. It's <laughs> cool. Did you want to ask awesome. um, Elizabeth if there was any, did you want to ask Elizabeth about the update on the? 85? No, on the oh, yes. legislative proposal. <laughs> So, um, so one thing we would like to cover in the legislative and regulatory affairs update is item uh, 21C, and that w is related to the California Psychological Association legislative proposal regarding new registration category for psychological testing technicians. Um, wanted to make sure that um, we received an update from CPA about this. Um, Dr. Winkleman? Um, thanks for the opportunity to give an update, and I just wanted to thank the board and the board staff again for their preliminary input on this um, uh, legislation that we're developing. We do have draft language, and we hope to find a legislative sponsor within the next few months. And once we do have a bill, we're going to be bringing it back to the board and asking for your um, support. So. I'd be glad to answer if anyone has any questions about this. 
Okay. Well, thanks very much. Oh, real quick, sorry. I yeah, think yeah. In terms of getting that language over, I'm curious if it makes sense for that language to just head straight to the legislative committee rather than coming to the board first, because it's going to end up getting referred out to the legislative and regulatory affairs committee. Right. Well, I think we can get a preview of it. If they have a yeah. Spot. Generally, that would be the process. You will have a board meeting before you have a legislative and regulatory affairs okay. committee. So, but it's always the purview of the board where you want it to start at. Whatever works for Dr. Phillips and the rest of the board. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier would be better as far as I'm concerned, just so that you would have the opportunity, if we had any additional thinking on it, um, to make it the most cooperative process possible. <coughs> so perhaps after you secure an author, we could at least see a preview of it. Sure. Will we get that to you as promptly, and then it will be up to the board to let us The know board probably will not take a position okay. until such time as it's been submitted to committee, I assume. Yes, that's, I think, where I was trying to go with that. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, okay. We're all clear, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We can still provide technical feedback. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest helpful. that you can always submit it to staff for technical input as well. Mm -hmm. Great. And the intention, Dr. Wickham, is to go for 2020. Is that to, in, to have it introduced in February by the February deadline? We're hoping to have it introduced in 2020. Of course, we don't, you know, we don't know yet. Things are just ramping up. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll, as soon as we do have that, um, I'll contact the board staff and they can advise us on the how to route things and bring it to the board's attention. Okay? Thank you. Sounds Thanks. great. Okay. So actually, we also have uh, an item that we do need to cover on the agenda, which is legislative items not on the agenda that people wish to put on a future agenda. Um, I will mention parenthetically that the subject of CANRA will be on the board's next agenda. The CANRA, the Child Abuse, Neglect, and Reporting Act. Um, so we will, and sorry, I, I'm glad you reminded me we use too many acronyms around here. Um, but uh, there's, uh, you know, sufficient, su significant developments afoot in that area, and we're hoping for greater clarity for our, for our own benefit and that of the licensees. Um, so, does anybody have any legislative items that were not on the agenda that they wish to put on a future agenda? Okay. Um, then the last item would be uh, recommendations for agenda items for future board meetings. Again, we can't take any action on any recommendation, but we can certainly uh, place the, the matter on the agenda for a future meeting. Are there any additional items people would like placed on agendas for future meetings? Um, I. Um, would like to talk about the EPPP2 pilot exam that I um, I did. Oh, cool. She took it. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Let me make clear, she's licensed already. She did <laughs> In her capacity as a board member. <laughs> <laughs> so hearing no, from no uh, additional agenda items from the the board, uh, any public comment on additional agenda items? Okay, I just would like to finally say it's been a real, uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve as your president for four years, and it's been really a wonderful experience, maybe one of the highlights of my professional career. On the other hand, I'm ready to take a slightly more backseat position and focus perhaps a little bit more on my practice than on emails. So, <laughs> all that being said, I really thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I think we have a great board and a great staff, and I very much would like to uh, extend my thanks to Antoinette, the other managers, and the staff members uh, for all the support they've given me during my presidency. Thank you. Move to adjourn. <laughs>